for your attendance at the press conference. This is going to conclude our news portion of it, but I know you want to stay tuned for what's coming up next uh, because, in my opinion, this is the most important two hours in gaming. It's my pleasure to introduce to you the technical director at id Software, the smartest man alive, John Carmack. All right, John, thanks. <laughs> All right, so I gotta say, I am especially happy to see everyone here this year because it was a dark day when we heard that the Anatol Hotel was pulling the reservation for QuakeCon so they could have a pharmaceuticals convention there. Like, what the hell? And we're looking at this and thinking, people are gonna think Zenimax isn't cool, like they're, you know, they're canceling QuakeCon or something. This just isn't right. So it was, it was such a good thing that everybody ran around scrambling for a couple of weeks and we managed to get the Gaylord back here, which has always been a great location for QuakeCon. So this is, I'm amazed it's all gone as smoothly as it has. <laughs> because there was some significant panicking involved there after that. But uh, so a lot of people have told me that my talks have been getting more and more approachable each year here, and it's because we have more and more stuff going on. So instead of spending two hours talking about, you know, obscure edge aliasing filtering algorithms or something that only the 20 people here really actually care about, I get to spend all this time covering uh, all the other things that are going on. And there is so much going on now. I mean, I may wind up filling most of the time before, you know, without getting down into the super geek details uh, anymore, because we've got company level things, big stuff going on there. Uh, and then we've got all the projects that we're doing, the plans for the future. I mean, the, when we talk about our plans internally, we're like, my God, we're planning things out five years from now. We kind of know what's going on for all this stuff and all these different things. But the, the biggest thing this last year, obviously, has been id Software becoming a part of ZeniMax Media. And that was a shock to a lot of people. And in fact, internally, when it was going on, the first meeting that Todd had, where he mentioned to everyone on the board, it's like, hey, we're having some discussions with these guys from ZeniMax Media. I said, who? I'm, you know, I had to go and look up on the internet and say, oh, Bethesda people. OK, so that now I have something to kind of correlate all that with. But I am. You know, it was an interesting thing, and I know when most people heard that id Software was being acquired, the question was, was it Activision or EA? And that would be the only things that people would consider there. And honestly, if you had asked me several years ago, uh, if id Software is ever acquired, I would think, well, it's probably going to be Activision or EA. And it is interesting that, honestly, I try to stay out of most of the business stuff as much as possible. I mean, I'm a maker, I'm an engineer, I like to sit I like to spend most of my time in front of my computer actually producing something. And while over the last several years we've tried to get a lot more sort of rigorous and responsible about running the company properly just because we've got so many people in it. You know, when you have, when you have a dozen people you can afford to kind of go and do whatever you want. You know everybody, you know what everything's going on. But when you've got 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 people, you know, you have to start paying a little bit more attention to that. So, over the last few years, we've had our, our regular board meetings, and I've been sitting there going to the board meetings. When they go over about an hour, I start getting these spastic twitches about wanting to get out of the business meetings and get back to actually doing some, you know, some productive work on uh, building things. But the, uh, the kind of the acquisition talks have been going on. It takes a long time to sort of finish these things up. And we've had these offers since the very beginning. Most of you probably don't realize that id Software was almost bought by Sierra Online right about the time we were releasing Wolfenstein. And that was, uh, we were all down in California seeing the Williams out there. And that was something that could have gone one way and wound up not going that way. And it all worked out well. But we would get a steady stream of offers over the years. and. It was, you know, it's always flattering when people come up and say, oh, you know, toss out some big number figure about wouldn't you like to sell the company for this. But, you know, we, we took a lot of pride in being an independent company, and there were, there were some things to be said about that. There was, uh, like, there was an email or a discussion on Slashdot a few years ago uh, about independent game studios. 
And there was a, a, a passage on there when people were talking about that, and somebody brought up id. And it was, you had one of those little manifesto types that goes on about independent studio starving artist types. And I was really heartened when somebody else pitched in and said, no, id software is an independent studio. They're just a successful one, as the difference there. And there's some level of pride in being one of the few remaining big independent studios that's not part of a larger corporate structure. But it's always something that you balance out. It was never, you know, going into doing this was never because we desperately wanted our own company. We wanted to build our games. We wanted to be in an effective position to do that. And we've gone a long ways and done a lot of good things there. But we've always kind of kept our eyes on what we're doing, what the options are. And some of the things that we've really seen over the last several years as we've gone through I, the last few big projects, Quake 2, Quake 3, Doom 3, working with all the other stuff, is that more and more there's been a tension between the independent developers and the larger publishers. Uh, for instance, when, when we first started doing the early work with Activision, you know, we were their shooter guys. You know, id Software was Activision's FPS arm, and we went out and did the titles, and everybody's pushing for the same thing. But as Activision grew as a company, and they brought more studios on, they had other people that were doing similar things, and we would find that as an external developer, we're to some degree competing with our own publisher there. And there's nothing... They're not colluding about it or anything. It's just a natural way that things happen. If you're part of a company there and you have your internal IP that you've spent tens of millions of dollars developing and you've got your external IP that you're paying a really large royalty rate to this company for, if you've got a choice about how certain things are done, whether it's marketing resources or how you want to present things, how you want to slate things, marketing, uh, production resources, I'm these decisions just as a large company they get made in their best interests which are usually not exactly the best interests of the external companies um, that was part of the move towards uh, EA partners with Rage and that we felt that there was a little bit less tension on that because of the way that organization is structured there but it's still not the same thing where when they're working for an outside developer they don't have the same level of buy-in no publisher does because if they're gonna put 20 million dollars into marketing something, they feel a whole lot better inside if it's their own product. If they know that they're going to be doing the sequels, they're going to have all of this stuff going on, while if they know that they're spending all of this money building up the IP for something that could wind up going to a competitor next cycle, or just somebody else's value that they're building up, it's not real comfortable for them for all these eminently understandable reasons. So that's just something that we've been living with over the last few years, and our game plan, if you had asked us a year ago, and in fact, I, I joke to some of the employees that these talks that I give here at QuakeCon is sort of our game plan going forward. And I was talking last year about how we were doing with internally developing Doom, how we're going to take it all the way to sort of a vertical slice on our own nickel like we did with Rage, and then we're really going to twist some arms on the publishers to make them cough up a really good value for us. That worked well for us on Rage. Um, we had built up the team. It was going well. And that was still a, you know, a perfectly fine plan. And we were always at the position where, well, if none of this works out, that's what we're doing. We're going to continue building Quake Live. We're going to continue building our mobile stuff. These smaller, lower risk projects let us sort of experiment on things. Uh, they are, in many ways, those are the tentative steps of a less well capitalized company. While id Software is plenty successful, we make a lot of money, we're able to go off and do new things, like I can say, I want to do mobile products, or I think we should do a web version of Quake Arena, and we can go make those things happen. But they're still, um, you know, those are things that are measured steps. They're things that we know that we can build out of our own pocket, we can fund ourselves, but there are certain things that we would not do on our very own, like take a brand new AAA title, build up a third team, and try and run that all on our own before signing a publishing deal, because that costs, you know, 20 some million dollars or something plus to get to that level. So the steps that we would take as a company when we were completely independent were cautious, they were things that we knew would succeed uh, based on kind of our previous work, or were things that we could afford to see fail. And that, uh, you know, that affects how we staff things, uh, what people we put on different projects, and all sorts of things like that. But it was still a good plan, and we were fine going forward. When we really got down to talking about 
what would be the benefits of becoming a part of Zenimax, becoming essentially a partner with Bethesda? It was interesting in that, again, a year ago, I probably wouldn't have thought about this level of benefit. In the, while we always talked with the whole range of publishers, and while, like, on the last pitch for Rage Publishing, in the end it came down to EA and Activision, but we had some really good offers, and we felt good about some of the people at THQ and Sega. Uh, they came in, they made good pitches, and unfortunately, in the end, it just kind of came down to we felt more secure with the larger companies. And when we take that to say, well, how did we wind up then becoming a part of a company that's not one of these massive uh, kind of the behemoths of the industry there? But when we look at it from becoming a part of the company, there's different there's kind of different measures of what's good for us in there. Uh, if you're going to be if you're going to be part of a company there, you want to make sure that you're not going to be internally competing with established people inside there, where if we did become part of Activision, there's a couple studios in there that we would be, you know, right there with about who's going to be doing what shooter in what quarter, how are we going to schedule all of this out, how is this going to be differentiated from this other one. It's like, well, if you want to do it that way and they want to do it this way, maybe somebody has to give a little bit so you don't step on each other's toes too much. With Bethesda, it was one of those it's hard to imagine a more perfect fit between two companies there where you've got two companies that do absolute top-notch AAA titles. You know, there's, there's not a lot of dead weight going on in the Bethesda team on there. With the, the products that they've put out, they, they define state-of-the-art top-notch in what they do. But what they do is this completely separate genre from what we do. There's obviously a lot of overlap in the players between it. I mean, the Lots of good cheers for Fallout and Elder Scrolls here because a lot of you play those games, but they're not direct competitors. You know, what we're doing with Wolfenstein, Rage, Quake, Doom, all this, uh, all this stuff over here is really orth uh, orthogonal to what Bethesda does with Elder Scrolls and Fallout and some of the other things that they're working on there. So we can look into this and say, there are things that each of us can do to help each other there. Uh, it's great to be able to start opening talks with them about technology sharing. There's not going to be any wholesale engine changes anywhere. I mean, they, they have their technical path, we have our technical path, but it's going to be great to just be able to help them. And I've always been in this position where, as anybody that's heard me talk here or has caught me someplace I, you know, at any I convention or after I'm, I'm always more than happy to, to lay out any technical plan, give advice or anything on there. But there's always I, you know, a little bit there where you shouldn't. When you've got competitors on there, I kind of look at the fraternity of programmers and game developers as I, you know, a little bit more open and I'm more happy to share there than uh, than a lot of people might be. But still, there's this sense that. Do you really want to give a direct competitor something that's going to be helping them out on there? With, uh, with a team now that's essentially our partners on this when we're all together, it's going to be great to be able to just go in and say, anything that we can possibly do to help them, uh, we will. And then they have a lot of experience with things like downloadable content, the way they've run their marketing campaigns, and a lot of things on that side of the business that, that we need to learn from. And they are great people there that are going to be helping us out with this. So the combination of the two core companies, and it's interesting in that this really is almost a, uh, on the development side, a merger of equals, where we've got about the same number of people at it, about the same number of people at Bethesda, and then they have their other, uh, their other kind of business units doing different things there. But it's not like being absorbed by a conglomerate here. It's not like us becoming some tiny little appendage on some larger company there. This is something where, in many ways, it feels like an incredibly well-funded startup uh, in that we've got this company that has a lot of capital behind them and then you've got a couple game development teams that are getting ready to do really big things and they've got big plans on where they want to go with all of this and I have confidence in their executive team and I think that they can take us places that we never would have been able to go on our own. And the bottom line is, from a consumer standpoint, from people playing games, this is such a pure win. I mean, there is, there is no downside at all conceivable to this. I mean, they are, we are still down here in Texas, they're leaving us alone, we are building our products here, but we have more resources to make some of those steps that we wouldn't make left to our own. We are staffing up a third team internally. We will eventually be producing three AAA titles. We still have this problem of having more 
good IPs than we can develop, even if we get to staff up to that point of three teams. And one of the big questions is, uh, what are the next titles going to be? Is it going to be a Rage 2, a Wolfenstein title, a Quake title? And we really don't know yet. But we have more to throw at these titles on here. There's no, nobody coming down and saying, oh, it's got a ship in this quarter, because this is an overlooked thing. ZeniMax is a private company. They're not a public company that has to go out and give the quarterly investor uh, talks where they go and say, we're going to do this in this quarter and this in this quarter. And both Activision and EA do suffer from that. And while they've never been in a position to make us do something, when we say it'll ship when it's done, that's in our contracts. I mean, they, I, they can't make us ship something. Occasionally, some other companies or some other developers get into a position where the corporate boss says, you've got to get it out in this quarter, period. And we've thankfully never been uh, in a position where they can say that to us. But occasionally there is a little bit of pressure. You know, there's the little bit of hinting, we would really, really like you to get it out in this time. And there are little bits of arm twisting that they can do, uh, you know, to kind of exert a little bit of force there. So that's one of the other not immediately obvious advantages of ZeniMax. But the bottom line being, great partner company to be with, really strong company to be a part of, lets us do more sooner than we would have been doing before. And really the rest of it, as far as the games that we're making, what we're doing, that's not changing at all. We've just got a little bit more resources at our disposal here. So most of what I said last year still kind of applies in what uh, the directions that we're going. We just get to ramp a few things up a little bit better. Uh, we got updates on all those things. So it's, I'm, now, some people would, would say, don't you get a little bit uh, like misty-eyed thinking back about all this? Isn't this the end of an era or something? But uh, I'm a remarkably unsentimental person. I, you know, I really don't spend a lot of time going on about the good old days or how wonderful things were back then. Because in any way I choose to measure, you know, the good old days are right now. Everything is better now. I mean, the, the games are better. You know, there's better people on a bunch of the teams. There's just... It's a great time to be working on this. And you know, to reiterate and drive home the point, there were questions immediately uh, after all of this. Oh, so does this mean that you guys have cashed out? You're, you know, you're getting out? Or is John going to go fly rockets all the time or whatever? And, and you know, no, they're, all of us are committed for really the foreseeable future. I mean, as we look over multiple product cycles, I'm still excited about all the technical things that we're going to be doing in the coming generation, the titles we're going to be producing. And it's like, yeah, it's not bad to have, I, you know, to have a good more chunk of change to backstop my rocketry stuff if I need to on there. But my day job is, is in software, and that's where it is for the foreseeable future. So I, we're internally, I, you know, we're very happy with this in a lot of ways. And at this point, almost nothing changes. Some of the great stuff is I don't have to go to board meetings anymore, which is great. I, you know, I can just kind of pawn off most of that stuff. I can sit down at my table and work on the things that I really want to work on. I, you know, I've got other people being responsible about all of that, and that's good for me because there is, you know, there is a ton of stuff going on and a ton of work to be done. Uh, to start kind of like ticking over all the major products here, projects here. You know, we hit all the, all the points in the press conference, but big one obviously is Rage, where we're at this point now where the game is working, uh, all the major technical pieces are done. Uh, we're still, until it ships, we're going to be going through space and performance optimization on there, but all of the big question plays uh, are pretty much resolved. But of course, the difference between a good game and a great game, or a spectacular landmark game, is all the stuff that happens at the very end of the development. Because if you stop a game development too soon, uh, or you don't put that final level of polish in, then you get just another set of games that, you know, the hundreds of games that come out, maybe look pretty or whatever, but to reach that level of being something that people are going to deeply love, that they're going to want to play over again, that they're going to remember, that they're going to talk about, uh, the special games that we've done so many times in the past, I, that's where all the work that we've got to do now is. You know, the work that I'm doing now is not in writing new technical subsystems, things like that. Uh, it's down to the point of working on picky stuff, like our resource management to make sure that you know, we fit on the things, that we're reliable and fast between levels, working on 
tiny little user interface things like making sure that there's absolutely minimal latency possible between the time you press something on the joystick, something happens on the screen. I, one of the things that I still argue with lots of people over is trying to make sure that the, all the user interface stuff is clearly legible because I know it's horribly ironic for a graphics programmer to have horrible eyesight, but I have a hard time uh, reading lots of tiny text, so I'm always the one in there telling the designers and, uh, and graphic artists that, okay, this needs to be bigger, things like this. Uh, an interesting point on that where uh, it was actually just a couple weeks ago, Robert Duffy, the lead programmer, was commenting how, because I harp on this all the time, so he brought this to my attention on there, where he, when he played Fallout 3 first on the PS3, he thought, well, this is pretty good, but when he played it on his PC, he found that he enjoyed it so much more just because everything was immediately legible. And while it's true that lots of you are younger and probably have better eyesight, but for those of us that are aging and deteriorating a little bit on there, there's much to be said for making sure that you sacrifice a little bit of artistic aesthetic design on there just to make sure that you can actually read all the information that you're trying to convey. So I still have battles yet to be fought on some of the rage design on that. I am. But then all the, the little things that we've gone through that we know how to do in other projects. We've gone through and tuned games before where the, the dozens of little things you do that everybody here has played first-person shooters that just don't have the right feel. You know, maybe it looks okay, but something's missing there. And the, the punch of the weapons, the feedback of attacking the enemies. And you can make lists of all of the things that contribute to this. And there are so many of them. I mean, there's the obvious things about what happens with the animation, the sound, the muzzle flash, the ejecting brass, the kick of the view head, the response of the enemy character there, the particles that come off, the haze that fills up, the things that explode in the room, the marks that you leave on the walls, and you can go on and on and on about these are all of the ingredients that get stirred into a really gripping game experience. And, and we are in the process of tuning all of these things. That part's not done yet on Rage. And we're still arguing over things about how you choose to select weapons, I, you know, whether you wind up having dashes versus crouches, and how you lay all that stuff out. Uh, we have started our first little bit of user testing on here, working with EA to go ahead and take uh, random people, starting them through, giving them tasks. And we are going to do a better, more rigorous job at this than we ever have on our previous projects. Uh, certainly, you don't want to let testers design your game for you. I mean, that is a trap that you can fall into, where you have to have your vision of what you want to do and then sculpt it with the feedback that they have from there. You don't want to design by committee and just say, everybody write down your suggestions of what's going to make the most awesome game, because that just that doesn't work out. You have to have some kind of guiding style and focus there. But what we do really want to watch is, when people sit down there, what do they have trouble with? Do they constantly overshoot here? You know, can they not figure out how to do something? Is this not working well for them? And there's still a lot of debate over some of that stuff, like uh, quintessential FPS gameplay questions about do you, with the mouse and keyboard, things are so much nicer. But when we consider that the majority of people that will play this game will be playing it on a gamepad, uh, you have to think about things. It's like, okay, do you want to give them complete freedom of movement and help by aiming the gun? Or do you want to tend their view towards things and make it a non-linear feedback? And there's all sorts of picky things there. And then even when you get down to much lower level things, like an interesting thing that I did uh, like a month ago or so was I set up tiny little things like the ramp of what fraction over you are on the joypad, equaling what speed and sensitivity. And these are things that there are not clearly correct answers for. It's what feels better, what can people be a little bit more accurate with. And like I made some subtle change in there, and every person that tested it thought it was marginally better. And these are tiny things. They're subtle, almost subliminal things. But it actually makes me want to look at something like that and say, you know, it would be great if we had... Uh, almost a mini game or something that just tested that thing and then we could use like an evolving genetic algorithm to piece together different control ramps to kind of find the optimal first person aiming ramp on there. I uh, am so there's I uh, you know there's lots of stuff yet to be done on uh, turning rage from something that's it's at the point where it's awesome. It looks great. Everybody should take a look at uh, Tim and Matt running through it. We've been showing it to some press yesterday and earlier today and this will be a live Tim and Matt up there with game controllers playing it. God, I hope it doesn't crash. Uh, you know, whenever you get up there and uh, do that in front of a whole bunch of people, you run that risk early on. But we have to 
you know, we have to cover it in quality at this point. You know, it has to turn out and have no gaping holes because so much of what games are today, it is, you know, games are awesome today. I mean, the whole field, there are, we have great competitors, we have awesome peers making good games here, and you have to, you have to have your hook, you have to have your thing that you do better than the other people, but there's so much stuff that you have to be just as good as everybody else as, and you have to make sure that you don't do anything that looks stupid. And that's, I, you know, the more aggressive you get in your scope, for years, id Software avoided doing people because it's so easy to make people look stupid. Zombies are great. You don't care if they look stupid because their brains are damaged. I, you know, that's, that's a great excuse. And some of the, uh, you know, that's great game design when you, th you think about it. You want to pick your battles in such a way that the things that you don't think you're all that good at, you minimize. But, of course, Rage is a people game. We have deep characters, lots of stuff going on in there, huge amounts of work going in on the animation and art side to make these characters really, they're not generic stand-in guy here that gives you your weapons. These are people with characters that you're interested in. They have great voice talents behind them, the animation, facial work, all this stuff is really good, far better than anything we've ever done before. But that's still one of my deep worries is that people, we have, I have noticed myself many times recently just feeling very happy with the state of the game where I've got it sitting there on my monitor and I'm looking at it and you've got some dust blowing around, the foliage waving, everything looking awesome, I, shadowing looking great, uh, character walks by, everything is just looking fabulous, running at 60 frames per second, and then like the IK screws up a little bit and he jiggles up and down a couple times. I'm like, damn it, we have to, we have to root out all of those things because you can look so good and then you just have like one little misstep in there and it can really take it down a notch. And I'm, I'm not yet clear if we're going to be able to get all of those things out. Now people forgive games a lot. If you're enjoying the game, you know, its faults become character to some degree. It's not the things that, you know, you'll really bitch and complain about. But if somebody's on the fence about a game or if their first experience with it is something like that, that can set a bad tone. And one thing that we've done with Rage that we always wanted to do in previous titles and usually didn't is we've actually saved the very first level to be the last one built so that I, you know, you, there's pros and cons to that. The pro is that everybody knows exactly what they're doing. By the time we get to this point in it, the artists, designers, programmers, everybody knows what they're doing and it can probably be some of the best part of the best stuff in the game. Uh, the con is that it hurts you when you're doing testing because you have to, instead of saying, here's the start of the game, pretend you just unwrapped it and stuck it into your console, you have to say, all right, here's the setup, here's where you are in the game, this is what you're supposed to have learned, and that's a little bit of a drawback. So uh, one of the remaining parts that we haven't done yet is the very first part of the game, and I'm hoping that we get to that pretty quickly so we can start running people through from the beginning and see how far they get and really kind of learn that whole gameplay experience. But, uh, you know, but overall, at this point, I'm, I'm very happy with how Rage is looking the, as a project, not just visually. And there are still, we may still have problems fitting onto the, the split DVDs for the 360. Uh, there's still questions about exactly what the multiplayer component of it is. There are some significant things to still be developed there. But Rage is a product. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to come out, it's going to exist, it's going to be really good. Uh, we still have to put in that whole final crunch effort to make sure that it goes from just really good to spectacular. But we've got a great team on this. We've got people that, this has been our longest development project ever, but we do still have most of the people that started the project still working on it, plus all the people that we've added to fill out all the media work that needs to be done, all the extra design and programming. Uh, Robert commented a while ago, Robert Duffy, that when he joined ID, we had, now we have as many programmers on the Rage team as we had employees when he started. So the company has grown into, you know, it's a much, much bigger place. And, you know, there are, you know, there are aspects of that that I do miss from the smaller company. I, you know, recently I spent some time working on iPhone projects. And that's just a completely different world where I could go off and just me personally kind of go over here, work really, really hard for a while, and a product pops out. I am, and to contrast that, I mean, certainly it's cheating with using the classic stuff on there, using the, uh, the old media and things like, like that. But 
there is a lot of truth to this the kind of statement that a small a small team working on a tightly confined thing really can be an order of magnitude more productive. Like some of the iPhone work, I would have days where I write a couple thousand lines of code. You know, and, and pretty good code. Code that does what it needs to do, that accomplishes a, a lot of stuff that goes in and says, these are the things we need to do. I'm just going to go make all these things happen. And it happens in such a short amount of time. And then young programmers scoff at this when they hear stuff like this. But on big projects, you sometimes have days where you change five lines of code, or you just change one tiny little thing here, or you're just chasing a bug and you actually don't write anything new and the entire day goes by and you're like, ah, I didn't accomplish anything. And, you know, that's hard. I, for people that like to build things, there's this sense of going in and building a whole bunch of stuff and it's great. I, but the flip side of that is that we are building monuments with these current titles. I mean, the big title developments, when you do put 15 programmers on it and all of these people and you write millions of lines of code, you know, these are titles that literally we couldn't have imagined 20 years ago when we were starting working on these. They are so fabulous uh, with just everything that gets done in there. And it is more than one person can do or you could get done in a short amount of time. It takes a lot of people and a lot of man hours and it is unfortunate that this kind of combinatorial communication thing just piles up. So each person, no matter how good, the larger the team, the bigger the project, the larger the code base, the less efficient they actually are. And it runs through in the back of my mind. It's like, well, couldn't we just split up and have 20 teams doing little projects? And there's an appeal to that, but the difference is the market is also kind of nonlinear in its response. The number one video game, uh, computer console game, uh, has sold more than every single iPhone title ever made put together, doubled at least. Uh, so there's a reason that we have 100 person teams on some big products on there because that's how kind of the winner comes out of the market and if you didn't put that extra effort into it and you go from being number one to being number 20 on there, you're just going to be thinking in the back of your mind, well, did not putting that 50% more effort in mean that we made 1 20th of the impact that we wanted to on there? So we are kind of covering all the bases on there. Uh, I am really enjoying doing the mobile work. I, the stuff that, let me, let me go in order here on big project to smaller ones and come back to that. So I can't say too much about the Doom project on there because it is kind of funny that we have the Doom team on the bottom floor of our office and the Rage team up on top, and they staffed up pretty quickly. Doom is a great draw. I mean, you can attract some of the best people in the industry to come work on the next Doom game. I mean, that is a power that we had as id to, to staff this up quickly and efficiently with the best people for all of this. That, that really worked out well. We've got a great crowd down there, but it is what you hear from everybody as companies go from 50 to 100 people, where you start wandering around and you think, I've seen you around a few times, I think you work here. Um, and there's that whole bottom, you know, most of the people on the bottom floor, sorry, <laughs> I, you know, I wish they'd come up to my office and introduce yourself sometimes because there is that weird thing about the company that I started on here when we have people walking around in this, working on the projects for us, and we just can't all know each other on that. Uh, and as we grow a little bit more, that's going to get to be a little bit more of an issue there. But Doom is an interesting thing for us. And I'm not going to say too much about it because it is Kevin's project and Kevin is playing everything really tight to his vest about this, about when he's going to talk about things. Uh, even before uh, the Zenimax deal on here, the plan was that we're going to be very quiet, we're going to go all the way to vertical slice, we're going to wow everybody with what comes out and not trickle much stuff out. But Doom is the first time ever in an id software project. I am actually not, I, that's not true. If you go all the way back to like Doom 2, I, where we were able to do a project I, without doing major technology development on it. But ever since we went from, you know, Quake, Quake 2, Quake 3, Doom 3 on here, each of these was fairly arduous uh, development changes on there. How I'd be going in, making big changes to the way the game works, the game engine, the code, all this, and it would leave the designers in this kind of wait and see mode about, well, how much can we have on here? Will we be able to do this? Will we be able to do that? And uh, it was not an efficient way to do development. I mean, it let us do some great landmark stuff, but I, 
you know, you would see people, especially at the beginning of a project where they're doing something, but the designers are really kind of marking time until what they feel all the tools that are necessary are available. And of course, the programmers and the designers butt heads a little bit on this, where the designers will be like, oh, you haven't programmed this stuff, so we're not going to do this. And the programmers are like, well, you should be working with what you've got available. And there's always that level of uh, kind of tension between the camps there. But with Doom, they've at least got something that has the Rage team, while we're not done, and there's still going to be some of those things where it's like, you said this was going to be in Rage and we counted on it, we're going to have to deal with some of those things. But they basically started, they were able to hit the ground running with fully functional technology, with a team that's already using it in media-rich applications, and it's basically, to a greater or lesser degree, working. And it can be a design-focused game rather than an exploratory technology development on there. And this is, it's an experiment for us where historically we've done our titles. Our plan has been get a bunch of smart, talented people together, say, work really hard, make something cool. And it's, it's pretty much worked out for us over the years. See, on two this. years from now, we say, oh, we're going to do a fourth team on this. Uh, I think there's enough factors that are going to keep us at that level. And we're, no, we're still in no huge hurry there. But it does bring up some of the real things that we need to start focusing on about how how can we leverage all of these things between us? How can we make sure that uh, you know, the code stays more common between it, that we have you know, the artists teaching each other how to do the things that they do, the designers conveying all of this, and we're still figuring all this out. I mean, we initially said, okay, we're, we've got this plan for how we're going to start managing the code base merges a little bit better, and we haven't followed up on it. We're all heads down our own projects. And these are things that we really have to to be aware of and work towards because it's easy to just toss out the bullet points of here's how we're going to leverage this, you know, this extra stuff here, but we need to buckle down and make sure we actually do that. And of course, finding time when you're trying to ship the other games is, is tough. So that's one of the big challenges still ahead for us. And the third uh, team at the main building, the Quake Live team, has been a, uh, it's been an interesting experience. Of course, I talked about this last year, and I kind of announced the idea the year before that. And I'm, there are certain things that I'm disappointed in how the project's gone, where at the start, we're again trying these experiments. Let's be, let's be a mature company and deal with licensed technology on this, because there had always been id Software had never really licensed technology for, you know, for a number of reasons, because we relicense technology, because I always want to make things open source in the end. Uh, we don't want encumbrances on that. So there were all these reasons, but uh, you know, part of it was I just thought that, well, we've got damn smart people in here. Uh, we think that we can do a better job with a limited set of things that we need to accomplish with this. But with Quake Live, I was stepping back, I'm like, okay, let's be a little more mature here. Let's go ahead. Most web type companies do the, are built on bolted together and licensed technology. Let's go out and license some core stuff on all the, uh, the game backend stuff, the backend server side on here. Uh, so we go and we do that, and then the company goes bankrupt, and they saddle us with the backend infrastructure that's caused us some significant problems over the time, you know, over the last couple years on that. And that's pretty unfortunate, but we're most of the way towards almost redoing almost everything that kind of came in as part of that. And that was uh, a shame that my first sort of gut reaction about maybe we should kind of do things uh, in a certain way instead of, uh, you know, instead of kind of going that way at the start, we meandered around and we're going to painfully make our way all the way back to that. Because some of the things that that, 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 that has impacted us on is that a lot of the core features that we knew were going to be really important for Quake Live, like the leaderboards, turned out the way they were set up and implemented to be just really uh, significant resource drains on the back end. And Oracle Enterprise is really damn expensive. Uh, for something that you're trying to get by on uh, you know, like web advertising and uh, you know, eventually some subscription pro, you know, premium services stuff on there, uh, looking at what it was going to take to scale up that architecture on a bunch of Oracle licenses was really kind of painful. So uh, things have been moved around to, uh, you know, to be working around that to the point where we're finally 
uh, hopefully going to be rolling everything out fully featured the way that we want to on there and be able to support reasonable amounts of users on there. Because for a long time we were, certainly at the beginning, we were stuck with these surprisingly high loads and we're like, okay, we're throttled down. I mean, I'm sure lots of people here were 10,000 thin line to get in at some point when we had the, the kind of waiting lines in there. And while eventually we got to a point where we were handling the load that we had from the people that were playing, we couldn't really go out and try and promote this because we knew we would just kind of melt down our infrastructure again until we wind up getting some of these things fixed up. So we think we're past most of that now where uh, the stuff that's, good, that's rolling out now, the competition focused things, the leaderboards getting back up, the Mac and Linux versions, uh, these were all things that we thought were important components of when we wanted to go out and really try and tell new people about it. Uh, one of the things that I, I take great satisfaction in is that the, the retention rate of people that have gone in and played Quake Live is uh, it's phenomenal. I think of the number of people, Marty said, were in one month, you know, played at least once a month on there. It's like half of the people that ever got through the registration process. So I think that we're doing something really good there, that we're providing something that, that people like, that has value. And I think that after we go ahead and do the final bit of polish, take the beta tag out, take, take it off, and then go ahead and run it out and try and push it out to a whole bunch of people and bring in new people that aren't kind of old timers from the Quake, Quake crowd, I think that's going to be interesting. And that's where we really find out whether Quake Live was, uh, you know, was a good idea or not. And you know, that is certainly one of the aspects of when we were a completely independent company. I was in the position where I could just say, I have an idea, let's go do this. We're going to go put some people on it. And uh, it'll be great. The mobile stuff has turned out well. Uh, that's been nicely profitable since we've been doing that. And the iPhone stuff looks really good going forward. I, I still have to see if Quake Live turns out to be one of those things where I said a couple years ago when I first announced it that uh, this is experimental, we'll see how it goes, and the question will be, does it go out and it looks like a great idea and everybody says, oh, you know, everybody knew that was going to be a good thing, or does it go out and just kind of limp along for a while and kind of get brushed under the rug? So we're probably going to find out in the next year what the, the success of all that's going to be. Uh, we are going to be continuously supporting it. The question, as we look at our resources going forward, we have to figure out how much effort we put into uh, updating Quake Live on there, you know, new maps, I, you know, new skins, tournament work, all this stuff. A bunch of this stuff's already slated, but the other thing that we were hoping to do with Quake Live was build a team that eats, breathes, and sleeps network gaming on there. You know, the people that have been working on the Quake Live team, that's all they do now. And we wanted to build that up as a resource so that they could be valuable to the other projects as well. We want them to take their experience about supporting a big multiplayer focused game and see how that's going to impact Rage multiplayer and Doom multiplayer. So we have these tough decisions about, do we leave all these people here? Do we bring a couple of them over and nucleate something else around them? Because the, the grand development plan is we get those people, they start working with IdTech 5 on Rage and Doom, and then we slowly grow the third team around them to be, whether it's Wolfenstein or Quake or whatever we choose to do next on there. So kind of managing this movement and growth of resources there. And we won't know how that, again, how it turns out over the, until the coming year. We see how the people work on the Rage team on there, uh, bringing in some potential additional outside people for working on that. And those are still kind of the hand-waving standpoint of we'll see what happens with all that. But I, from a quality standpoint, it is interesting to look at what Quake Live turned out to be. And it is, uh, it is grander and flashier and nicer than my original kind of vision pitch. And that is the difference between I, uh, you know, when you take the great media people, uh, the, the artists, the graphic designers, and the level designers that build the things and pull it all together on there, I, uh, when I look at the original idea on here, I close my eyes and it's like, okay, let's bolt Quake Arena inside a browser and do some webby stuff around it. And I'm like, we can do this in six months. <laughs> and I, you know, it didn't quite work out that way, but it's a better project for it. I, uh, when, when you look at the whole thing now with everything that's on it, uh, it's, it's pretty damn good and I'm very proud of, of how it looks there. And it is, it's everything that I would have expected it to be and a lot more. It just took 
three times as long to get to this point as I had hoped on the original one. So we'll see whether I, you know, whether the history of all this plays out. But I think that one way or the other, I would be shocked if I, I very much expect there to be QuakeLive.com games going on many, many, many years from now. Uh, it's you can't have something that so many people like that you can't find a good use for. And I think that we've got something that clearly a bunch of people really like already. And I think that we're going to be able to find some way to do something really cool with this. So outside of the mainline projects there, we have the mobile work. And we have, I, I don't know if it was announced at the, at the press conference there, but Doom 2 RPG for the Java and Brew phones is nearing completion. It's in beta right now. Uh, we're not 100% positive yet on whether we're going to do an iPhone version of that, but it is likely that we are migrating away from the Java brew market on there to focus exclusively on iPhone work for the mobile. It's not a foregone done deal conclusion here, but the, it's interesting to work on the other platforms, working on the Java games and the brew stuff and, uh, that play on many, many millions more phones than, you know, than there are iPhones, but there are some aspects to it that are you know, deeply frustrating. I, we have uh, like Wolfenstein 3D or Wolfenstein RPG on here. The, the original version that was done for the, uh, the Java Brew stuff on there, I think we got them up to like a meg and a half. That's all you have to cram the entire game into. I mean, that's like less than a fart noise on, you know, on an iPhone. It's just, I, it's crazy doing all of that. And it, It'd be one thing if it was a real technical limitation, if it was, honestly, this is all that the platforms can do. But the thing that makes it so, you know, soul-numbing is that it's just some arbitrary decision on the telecom provider's standpoint that, eh, we don't think apps should be bigger than 600K, or, oh, you twisted our arm, 1.5 megs. And it's a random decision, not based on anything real. Well, it is based on something from Many, many years ago, when all of this stuff was by the minute and people had larger downloads, people would download something and say, oh, I paid $6 for a game and I got a $12 data surcharge. You know, what the hell? And they'd call up and they'd have lots of tech support and can, and that was a problem. So they had made this decree years and years and years ago that all apps will be tiny. And things have just been stuck with that ever since. And these companies do not care about games. I mean, compared to uh, like text messaging or something on there, games are just some tiny little wart on the end of their services on there. And there's usually just like one guy in the company. You know, you may have a big company like AT&T or Verizon or whatever, and there's going to be like the one guy that deals with the gaming stuff. And he may not even give a damn about games. It's just his job to go and arrange the deck here. Uh, and there's certainly aspects of you know, who goes on the top of the deck is who slipped him a flat screen TV when no one was looking. And there, there is a little bit of that that goes on in the, you know, in that side of the business because deck placement is everything on those. Uh, nobody searches out the games that are, uh, you know, that they may have heard about one time. People go in, they look and see what the top five or ten games on their cell phone is. And placement up there, it's not, it's not necessarily a meritocracy. It's somebody making semi-random decisions. So that's incredibly frustrating. Wolfenstein, uh, or Wolf RPG on the iPhone, is something like 50 megs. You know, it's just got, it's blown out with super high-res artwork and sound and all this stuff. Uh, although it was amusing when I, I wound up doing the 3D acceleration on the Wolfenstein RPG for the iPhone. That was one of those uh, interesting things where they sent us the first build of the game and we're like, wow, this looks really good with all this high-res art. Why is it so slow? You know, what's going on? And it turned out they had just taken the software renderer, and this was done by Firemint, the, the company that's done some really successful games. That's why I was shocked at this, because they've done some great stuff on the iPhone. But they just took the software renderer and rendered it out on there, so it's chugging along really awful. And I was like, no, you have to do this in hardware acceleration. And they moaned and complained, said there wasn't the budget for it. Finally, I just said, give it to me, I'll go do it. I'm, and I got all their whole project, and that was the first time I started working on the, on the iPhone. And, and yeah, I did go ahead and, and put in the 3D acceleration, and it runs many, many times better. And that was the part where I said, oh, this is, this is fun working on the iPhone. I'm having a good time. It's back to that small project vibe. But uh, one of the things that was amusing there was we were 
close to memory limits on there. They were having some problems. And when I profiled through all of this, uh, I was like, uh, they're using 40 megs of core for sounds. That's our audio budget in rage. This is not right. <laughs> and they eventually compressed them down and, uh, and kind of made things work like that. But the, you know, it's many, many times more fun to kind of work on the iPhone platform than the traditional ones. But the other side of that is that the marketplace is just great. You know, the iPhone App Store, it is, uh, you know, th this really is the future of a lot of the digital distribution things and the way games are going to be sold to be able to get things out without having to go through, uh, you know, the first party licenses and the, dist uh, you know, the fabrication, all this stuff. It's great to be able to have anybody go in, get your Apple license and put a game up. And it's been great to see the success that a lot of teams have had with that. Teams that you wouldn't, you know, you're never going to see them go out and do a DS game or something like that that has a big barrier to entry. So the marketplace is... The hardware is half of it, but the marketplace really is the other half about why I'm really bullish about the iPhone. And the, the shame is that Qualcomm could have done all of that if the telecom providers had, had wanted to play ball. You know, like Qualcomm had their sort of App Store-like things that would have been better buying experiences, and people could program good games across Brew if they had better... Uh, if, the arbitrary resource limits were removed, but there was just no way to get these telecom companies to, to line up and all agree about it. They didn't care enough, and if they, you know, if they did care, they wanted a competitive advantage. They didn't want to be able to have somebody outside kind of setting things across multiple vendors' product lines on there. And, and I think that's, you know, that is a shame because there were good platforms there that could have been interesting, and I had hoped, one of my big hopes for the I, for the iPhone and the App Store was that Apple would shock the rest of the telecom providers into doing some of these things like this. But there is very little evidence that any of them have kind of gotten the message there. And at this point, we're, we're sort of giving up and stepping away from that and saying, I, you know, that we can do, we can make as much money on the iPhone and have a lot more fun doing it on that, you know, while we're there. So that's probably where we're going in the future. And we've got a big lineup. And it's, it's interesting now going from these four or five year huge development cycles where we're just, okay, you work and you work, you slog and slog and you're done, you ship it. It's kind of funny now, we're even having to schedule our iPhone releases on here where I... Uh, the original Wolfenstein classic was me just kind of going off on a lark. That was when I had fun working on Wolfenstein RPG. I, you know, I want to play with FPS controls. And we were playing a little bit originally with Quake Arena, but then I said, well, let's do something that I can not have to worry about optimization too much, go all the way back to Wolfenstein. And it was my toy for a little while, but after a couple days, it was to this point where, hey, this is fun. Let's finish this up, make it a product. This will be our, you know, our toe in the water and see how the iPhone app store works for us. And, you know, of course, it's always one of those things where you spend two days and it looks like it's 90% done. You're like, ah, this is great, but it takes two more weeks of work at least to go ahead and get to the point where you're ready to release it as a product. But we went out and it, it did great. And we got, people loved it. We changed a few things. We updated, fixed the things that people were complaining about. And that was the existence proof that the iPhone market was real. Because I had tried to go into it earlier. We wanted to port one of our, uh, like the Orcs and Elves DS game over to the iPhone. But we didn't have the right combination of the right people, the right resources. It would have taken me longer than that to do it all by myself on there. And I couldn't budget the time for it. So we, we missed the early launches that I wanted to be a part of. But once we went out there and said, hey, Wolfenstein did great on this. I... Now we're pretty sold on this, and then we, uh, we did the big work with Escalation on Doom Resurrection, which was, that was actually before Wolfenstein RPG iPhone, before Wolfenstein Classic, that was the plan to be our first iPhone title, because we were going to go out there, this will be cool, high tech on this, and it'll be a good foot forward for it, doing something that's designed from the ground up for the iPhone, designed around the controls. I, but that was a fairly big project. You know, it took the better part of a year to go through and do that, and it was reasonably high budget. It may have been the highest budget uh, iPhone title. We don't have good data across the industry on that, but it was high-end professional developers doing non-trivial amounts of work on this. And we, of course, it was an experiment trying to launch that at a premium level at 999. 
Uh, but it's done. It's earned out. Uh, it's profitable, and we've got a great sale going on now. Uh, we've got the point release coming out that has new features, no, new level, uh, new stuff coming. We've got a multiplayer version that will be coming later when 3.0 adoption is universal and some other things are worked out. So planned releases for all of that, and we think that's going to wind up doing pretty well. So we can now look at sort of three lines of products that we'll be doing on mobile. We've got the Classics line, and Doom Classic has been done for, you know, more or less done for a while, and I'm kind of sitting on it because we knew we had Wolfenstein RPG coming out, we had Doom Resurrection, we got Doom Resurrection Point release, there's going to be a Platinum Wolf 3D, and we've actually got to kind of schedule these things or we're going to have iPhone releases coming out almost on top of each other. And I'm still not completely sold on the merits of that. All the business, you know, business people, it, assure me that we really do want to do this because I'm eager to say, Doom is cool, let's get it out there, and lots of people love it and all this, but if we're trying to plan our, our press releases and sort of our focus schedule, what we want to run in quick live ads and stuff like that, it's still a question on that. And when it sits there for a month, every once in a while I go back and improve it in some way, muck with the controls, improve things a little bit. Yeah, so. That's all good, but I am eager to get that out because it's a good game. It's got Wi-Fi multiplayer on there, and, uh, and it's neat. And we've got, like on the Wolfenstein Classic, the next rev of that has downloadable levels in a really cool way that we've never been able to do on our other platforms before, it's really taking advantage of the iPhone here where we've got a, uh, a URL type defined for that. So you can go to a web page, click on a link, it launches Wolf, downloads the level, and starts playing it. And that's a feature in the coming update on that, which is kind of the way, and the initial release of Doom won't have that, but uh, the a point release or something later will. Uh, and I think that's, that's going to be great because I think that's going to bring back very much sort of the golden age of level creation because it's as the, those of you that have been here since the beginning know that there's been this ramp of difficulty where I, you know, everyone made Wolfenstein levels. You popped it up, it's just scrubbing out tiles on there. And then anyone with a little bit of dedication could make a Doom level. Uh, making a good Doom level, of course, was a completely different question on there. But everyone made their, you know, their house or office or whatever in a Doom level and ran around and shot their boss in his, in his office. But I... Uh, it got much, much harder after that, and the barrier to entry for Quake levels uh, was up there. And then when you got all the way to the Doom 3 level, and let alone the Rage level, it's just to the point where you don't casually get into level creation nowadays. That's when you're kind of making the decision, I want to dedicate a significant chunk of my life to doing this. You know, maybe I want to get into the game industry and show people that I've got the dedication there, but it's not something you just kind of pick up on a weekend and do. And I think that the phone games are going to be back to the good old days like that because you will have people that uh, you just break out the old Doom editors, fire up DOS box for some Wolf editor, and eventually somebody is going to make a nice modern one for all of this. And you can make the level, and there's something fundamentally cool about, you know, you just kind of pull out your iPhone and say, look at this level that I was making, give it a try to your friends. Uh, there's a level of raw neatness there that we never really had in the... You know, the mod scene where it was always a matter of figuring out what to download and install, where you put it, how you get into doing this. It, I, I think that's going to be a, uh, a good step forward, and we want to do that through all the classic games. Because I do expect that we're going to hit the whole range of classic games, and we're just going to go chronologically. You know, Wolfenstein, Doom, Quake, Quake 2, Quake Arena, and, you know, eventually we'll be able to move Doom 3 onto, like, 3GS level hardware on there, and certainly whatever, by the time we get there, it's going to be interesting for that. So classic games, definitely coming. Then we have uh, the RPG class of games that uh, we're going to see how people respond to Wolfenstein RPG. I'm, it's, it's, I, I'm actually really happy right now with our product line. We have Wolf Classic, which is a control-oriented Twitch uh, FPS on there. We've got Doom Resurrection, which is interesting in the sense that uh, because it's, it pulls you through the experience and you aim like this, uh, it always looks cool, where Wolfenstein 3D or Doom Classic, the first time people are given a touchpad, it's like the first time you're handed a gamepad to, you know, to play an FPS on there. You know, you're looking around like this, bumping into walls, and it's, it's not necessarily the best foot forward there. I mean, people that have been through a control transition or something, once they sit down and play it for a little while, they're, okay, I get it, I'm having fun now, but I... 
you know, I, I'm sure we lose a chunk of people over that first 20 minutes of gameplay on there about this is not the, the best lead in. While something like Resurrection is nicer in that it's still action twitch, you've got to shoot at things on here, but you can never be too far off. You know, you can be looking, your cursor can be down here shooting at the, the crate instead of the monster on there, but it's still pretty neat to watch as it goes on. You'll have to get better if you want to get further in it, but it's, it's neat and fun to look at and a good, good media experience right there. While Wolfenstein RPG on there is uh, a game which is tactical. You can sit there and you can think about it and move a step at a time. You're not going to get ambushed by anything, which is a more traditional mobile game on there where you can sit it, you can play it one move at a time, you can quit at any time, just pick back up from there. And that's, I think we've actually covered, instead of rushing out three FPSs or something, we've got three very different feel, uh, games that feel very different, even though they're all with classic id IPs on there. So uh, that's pretty neat, and we are probably going to be pursuing those three sort of directions there. Classics, designed from the ground up for iPhone, which will include probably a Rage-themed game. Uh, I actually have some... I'm not positive what technology I'm going to aim this at. There's a lot of good racing games already on the iPhone, but it's going to have to be something that has the Rage flavor to things. But one of the things that I'm very excited about is that uh, I think we can actually do Mega Texture, id Tech 5 level rendering technology on the 3GS iPhone. And uh, obviously you can't do the same polygon counts and things like that, but the fact that people a lot of people downloaded Mist at 700 megs. That's great. I mean, we were we had no idea about this. We struggled to fit the original Wolfenstein in 10 megs for the over-the-air download limit. Now that we're seeing people download 700 megs, great. You know, we're going to go make something really huge and cool with that. Where the thought is, I want to do something with id Tech 5 content creation technology deploying on the iPhone. And now, of course, that's a niche of a, of a sub-market on there, uh, so we can't, you know, we can't afford to put too much into that, so I'm still kind of making up my mind whether we want to take one game, whether it's a Rage game that we do for this, and have the special mega-textured version that's half a gig to download, and the normal version that plays on all the phones. So yet to make up our mind on that. I still have to do some technology research on that. Uh, you know, sometime, hopefully later this year, I'll be poking around at that a little bit. And then the third uh, level will be seeing how Wolf RPG is received on there because I would like to bring over uh, Orcs and Elves uh, that we did on the DS, which would be a uh, already a lot more media than the original cell phone games. Uh, one of the better designed uh, games in that you know in our set of things there, and then Doom 2 RPG since it's the most recently done one, and we can kind of build off of the Wolf RPG experience there. Probably bring that over. So, I mean, here we are looking at potentially eight iPhone titles. Realistically, we won't get them all done kind of at, the, at that pace, but I would expect an iPhone title from it every other month uh, over the coming year, uh, depending on how things kind of schedule out on there. And that's going to be neat. We get to have that, the cycle there with the users is something that I do miss from the earlier days. I mean, right now, we... We make feedback from the, game, the last game that we shipped, which was four years ago. Obviously, we're paying attention to what other people are doing on their titles, but it's a lot better to say, oh, six months ago, people really liked this in this title. This next one's going to uh, do everything that you used to do, do it better, make it more fun, and add new things on top of that. So being able to kind of cycle and evolve on that fast is going to be really pretty rewarding. So I, I guess that's the... That's the laundry list of id projects, three big ones, mobile projects on there, Wake Live as our, uh, our online component. And the, you know, moving on to more of the technology and platform side of things, we are still, uh, the expectation is all the major titles cross-platform across all the major ones, PS3, 360, PC, and we are also keeping the Mac on the, the initial release platforms on there. Um, that's all. Not much has changed since last year in terms of what uh, the state and the problems on there. Our estimations of them haven't really changed in that 360 is easier to develop for, easier to keep up running. Uh, the PS3 has, for, for compute-bound things, it does have a little bit more power. And we run into a few things where this actually matters now. With, uh, when we're looking at different compression methods for the mega texture stuff and some of them that are significantly more CPU-intensive on there, 
the PS3 has an edge in that regard. So you've got more processors that you can spit things out onto. Uh, and you can design things that will work better on the PS3, but it's a testament to the, the platform's place in things that usually it's the, the one that people haven't checked when they put in new things, the thing that breaks most often. The graphics processor interface is the most fragile of all of those. Uh, it's the easiest to mess up in our development strategy. And I, uh, you know, in the larger scheme of things, it's still great. I mean, I, I know Sony, uh, Sony fans get upset when somebody talks about all of this, so it's important to reiterate that all of them are so far better than anything else that we've ever had before, and in fact, they're closer together in capabilities and development, uh, development niceness than any other generation. So they're all good to work for on there, and uh, we do expect that Visually, there's still that odd chance that depending on what we do with the mega textures, we've got more space on the Blu-ray for the, uh, the PS3. It's got a dedicated hard drive on it. So certain aspects of it may be a, a superior performance, almost certainly will be versus a hard drive free Xbox on there. Uh, and that is the one thing that I wish could have changed if the Xbox had more, uh, more storage in the, uh, on the optical disc. Rage would have been one of uh, John Paul, one of our, our top programmers, has spent a large fraction of all of his effort in, through this project doing compression and other people doing management. And it's high end, hardcore work that if we could have just said, we have twice as much space, uh, we could have had a lot of stuff done a lot easier without going through all the sweat that we've got here. But the power is there. Give it enough, give it enough effort, it will turn out, it will work, everything's going to be okay on there. So as we start looking forward is where things get, again, interesting. And people are talking now about what the next consoles are going to be like, what the next generation of uh, kind of graphics paradigms and so on. And I had, I had hoped when I was talking last year, I was talking about the research that I was hoping to get to do. I haven't gotten to do any high-end graphics research in the last year. It's just all on getting the games done and production, all of this. So I'm saying it again, I hope real soon, maybe by the end of the year, I'll be able to go off and do some research work on this, on some of the directions that I want to pursue there, where it's kind of interesting in that some people would think that, oh, you sold the company, I, you know, now you can just kind of do whatever you feel like. But it's really kind of the opposite, where when it was, you know, our company or when I was the, the majority shareholder on all of this, there was a little bit more freedom to kind of think, it's like, well, if I want to go and work on something, you know, esoteric, I can if I want to. I mean, I'm generally too focused on the products to go, you know, to spend much time fiddling around on something else, but there's always that kind of comforting thought that, ah, I could stop and go do this, but I can rarely make myself do that. The, the mobile titles are about the only thing that's been able to, you know, that's been a little side research project on that. But being part of selling the company, it's got this strange feeling to me where I almost feel that I have to work harder and be more driven about this because they... You know, we had somebody that paid a lot of money for the company on the promise that we're going to deliver on these things, that we're talking about the things that we've been doing. And I actually feel, I think, more pressure that I need to get down and we really need to make these games great. You know, we, we said we could do it. Uh, we need to deliver on this. And I'm working on, you know, in many ways, some really boring stuff about resource management and setting up preloads and things like that. But it's important stuff. And I'm thinking that, well, maybe I could just have somebody else, one of our other 15 programmers work on that, and I'll go off and work on some blue sky fun research stuff. And at some point, we'll have to make that move. But at this point, it's still where the ship date is far enough off that better to put the leverage in now, because the more you steer the ship further away from its final destination, uh, the easier any corrections are going to be. So I have not yet gotten a chance to work on the big ticket research items that I want to for the next gen. But what we have been learning a whole lot about is massive data set production. Uh, with the way that we build Rage and the way Doom's being built on here, uh, it, it is an interesting stress of all sorts of different network and compute resources where we, uh, the levels, 
at their start, there are hundreds of gigs of space on here, of storage, what it takes, and you go out, mega texture, create all of this, and a lot of effort goes into making sure that these can be created in a reasonable amount of time, even things like copying them around for demos, where obviously in the end it has to come down and fit in some tens of gigs for shipping and distribution, but these intermediate steps before we profile everything off and compress everything down and pack and cut and dice and make choices on things, these are enormous data sets. And we are getting a lot of good experience with kind of working through things, render farms of uh, stuff that works on the offline processing, how we manage our network infrastructures and updating these things live. And we're still learning as we go on this. It's still not absolutely a turnkey solution. We do have... Uh, and it's unfortunate when you have expensive programmers babysitting a render farm sometimes, but we have to learn what all the issues are before we can automate all the solutions for them. Uh, but this is the stuff that leads into where I am still confident that the next generation is going. And I do think that uh, the big ticket, as I said last year, is virtualization of geometry the same way we're virtualizing textures. And I think the wins from the textures have been real. Uh, when you wind up uh, walking through Rage, looking at things, it does look like no other game because of some of this core technology that we've got there. I think it helps in what we do with the setting and the storytelling of the game, adding personality to it. Uh, visuals obviously aren't even the most important thing in games. You know, the gameplay is the most important thing, but you move on the things that you have tools available to. And gameplay doesn't actually change all that much with technology, so you keep refining that. The fact that the technology changes so hugely is where we get to go out and really try and make changes, make things move. Uh, so we've done that with the textures this year and the surfacing, and I do think that doing it with the geometry in the future is the big question, uh, the big direction. The open question is whether it winds up being something like a ray traced environment, some form of uh, dynamic retessellation, things coming out from traditional models on there. But the thinking is that right now, for almost everything, the artists model these brilliant, wonderful multi million polygon models, and then they render bump them all down to normal maps on the low poly stuff. And almost everything in the world is built this way. The thinking is that the next generation is we just don't bother with the low res step and everything is pieced together out of these multi-million polygon sets and you look at all that and you say, well, all right, you run all that through, if you store them all as triangle models, it's like, oh, that's going to be a couple terabytes for these big levels on there. But, you know, we can deal with that stuff nowadays. I, it may go back to the beginning where, uh, oh, this takes all weekend to run something here until we work through, get it all down to something that, okay, now it's only taking a few hours or you can run it overnight to do the processing there. But I have, I have a really good sense of the value that will come out of that. And some of the best, the best parts for me about looking at Rage are I, you know, seeing what the artists do with the games, and this has been the case all the way back, I mean, literally all the way back to Doom. We took a step from Wolfenstein, the original one, was clearly, it was an iconic thing, and there were, or even before that, like in Hover Tank, I remember discussions where uh, Tom Hall, the designer at the time, was saying, oh, that's a tree over there, and this is the entryway to this hall, like, that's a green block. That's a brown block. I, you know, it was not art at the time. It was presenting yourself into there. But every game after that have been, has had these moments where I look at the game and I'm like, wow, that's just, that's better than I imagined it would look. Because I suppose I have a conservative imagination for what comes out of the technology. I mean, I I look at it and say, this is how the rasterizer is going, these are the, the tables that are going on, this is the processing, and I have a view in my head of like, okay, we can do this, and this will be better than what any other game here is, and it'll be great. But every game I've been, I've had those moments, many of them in fact, where I look at that and just say, ah, that, that's better than I imagined this would look, you know, that's just great. And when you, know, when you can tell that some of the artists just really get it and they're, they're using the capabilities there, that's really good. And I, am, I have my eyes set on that in the next generation technology about seeing how when the artists can go in and sculpt everything much more free form and go in and make every little change that they want there, have hopefully a more interactive approach to everything. And that's, uh, you know, it is stuff like that that keeps me very excited. I mean, I... 
I am at least as excited about this coming generation of technology as I have been for anyone before that. I, you know, the downsides are that it's so much work now. You know, we do need the larger teams, but uh, the upside is the results are just amazing. You know, the stuff that we get out of it. So, it's uh, you know, that's still really exciting. Oh, and in fact, speaking of content creation on there, I'm talking about. Right. The Wii, again, is a console that we don't have any direct involvement with. And it's sort of a shame because I love the idea of novelty and companies trying something different instead of just bump the specs up a little bit each time, go ahead and try something different with the controls. So, I mean, huge props for Nintendo. And it's just great to see somebody go out, take a little bit of a right turn, and then just totally kick ass in the industry there and outsell everybody else. So it's a shame that we're not on the Wii. But it is interesting to look at what people are doing with motion control on there. And a lot of this also applies to the iPhone, as it's a different input device on there that you have to think about differently, and you don't want to just treat it as uh, a substitute for something that you've already got. Uh, but on the topic of uh, content creation, we had a demo recently. I don't know how many, how many people have seen any of this stuff from a company called Six Sense. I, that has a you know, six degree of freedom controller thing. And I went into that demo just so not expecting anything because we get a lot of controller demos over the years at id. And almost universally, they're not things that, you know, that I look at and say, OK, this is not going to be the next big thing. You know, this is going to be something that might sell to a niche little market, but just isn't all that great. So I, I don't think I've ever really been impressed by a controller. But the, the Sixth Sense stuff, I was impressed with. I, it is, it's what the Wii really wishes it was uh, in terms of the Wii does motion and pointing, but it's got that little IR camera and you have to, uh, you know, you have to point at the screen. And if you know what you're doing on it, yeah, it's kind of neat on this. But everybody wants the full-fledged lightsaber approach for things, and not just with a gyro either. I, Seeing a device like this, and of course it's early prototype work, you know, who knows uh, what it comes out to, but if that technology comes down and is affordable, I mean, that is what the next generation of motion sensing is going to be built on, because it is the lightsaber. And the thing that was kind of exciting in the near term about, I'm like, okay, man, we'll see about doing uh, control interfaces. It's not clear that motion stuff like this is all that good for FPSs. We'll see what can be done with that. But some of the most awesome stuff was just demos of using it for manipulating 3D objects. So we got one, and we're going to go ahead and like use that in our content creation stuff, just for placing objects, moving them around, because it really is that place it, do it, whatever you want like that. And uh, thinking about next generation content creation technology, flying around the world, just sculpting things off, carving them, stamping things down with our surface stuff, uh, there are going to be incredible opportunities for kind of artistic expression on there. And you know, we do still have this give and take with uh, the artists at, uh, at ID working on this on there. Uh, and now it does all this radiosity stuff I, you know, on a fragment level, uh, stepping across adaptively. But now, of course, if the artist says, I want to color that mountainside, uh, I want to go ahead and drop this stamp down, and I would like full lighting, full shadows, and radiosity, please. You know, they click on it, and then they can go get a cup of coffee or something and come back before they get to see the results of it. And of course, us programmers say, well, why don't you turn off the radiosity, turn off the shadows, and you know, drop it up there, and you'll kind of see what it looks like. But they insist that doesn't do the job, that, I, you know, that that doesn't let them see what they need to see. So we are still fighting performance on there. And that quest, you know, the quest is to have a completely interactive tool for everyone there, where they just go in there and it goes straight from artistic vision into the game world. And we balance the things on there where the stamping now is pretty good. You know, I, I think it's generally acceptable. Artists still somewhat disagree. We, we're running out of things that we could do to make it faster in the current paradigm, so they may just kind of have to live with it and start turning off some of their features for a while. But I, the other side of that, though, is the full regenerations, which do take kind of overnight, even when we split them out over a whole bunch of different servers on there. But that is one of those things that it's embarrassingly parallel. We can split it out over a whole bunch of different machines, and we can, to some degree, spend money to make that faster. And I, you know, to segue again into the concept of the parallelism on there, this is, there's some other interesting things where everybody knows that 
future of high performance gaming and everything, it's all about parallelism and how you get it. I, you know, whether it's multiple cores, I, you know, multi-threaded cores, uh, lots and lots of micro threads on, uh, you know, on GPUs, things like that. Uh, how you manage that is really the defining characteristic of a game engine nowadays. Uh, the exact questions on graphics and so on are, are small parts of it. And I, have, you know, I usually say that we get a lot of the press talking about mega texture and graphics and everything on id tech 5, but it's just not that much of the code in the larger scheme of things. And in many ways, the actual rendering stuff isn't very complicated. I mean, any, any re reasonable programmer can like open up our sort of fast render file, look through and, and tell what's going on. There's not much voodoo and black magic going on in how we draw things because everybody draws triangles. The real work is in figuring out how you can take advantage of all of this parallel resources and figuring out how, okay, drawing our stuff's not very complicated, but our feedback pass for updating all of the pages on the mega texture stuff, that's really complicated where it's something where we render a view here, again, simple drawing, but then it gets read back, it gets analyzed and processed in one job, it gets split out and figures, figures out which things can be pulled from a page file cache, which things need to be scheduled for loading. As they come in, spawns off lots of other jobs to transcode from offline JPEG or HD photo, whatever stuff, into DXT for rendering, sliced up into multiple pieces so you can get the maximum parallelization. And all of this stuff is uh, tough, hardcore, serious work in there. And I have a real fear about what this is doing to the code bases in that, you know, when six years from now, when I'm ready to put Rage onto the next iPhone whatever on there, I'm afraid there's going to be a lot of going back and looking at the code base going, my God, what is all this stuff? I, when I go back and look at the original games, you know, Wolfenstein or Doom, stuff that I haven't looked at in... 15 years on all of this stuff, it's, it's not that hard to find, uh, kind of find my way around on the things. And, you know, although there's sort of two aspects to that, I, I'm working in the Doom code base, and I'm kind of, how quaint, global variables, in net games, stuff like that. I, and it was, at the first it was like, okay, this is kind of charming and easy, but then as I move things around for a little bit, it's like, oh, there's good reasons why we don't scatter things around like that anymore. Uh, but still, the code bases are easy to work with. Uh, I have some concern about these modern code bases, not just because of their bulk, but because there's some complicated stuff going on that's not just, here's what you do in the game. You do this, then you do this, then you do this, and you've got a picture, you know, you, you read in the joystick, you do a bunch of stuff, you draw something on the screen, you show it to the person. Uh, but now with all the things going on for, you know, audio processing, the transcoding, all these other jobs, collision uh, detection is in a separate job, we've got uh, path avoidance, uh, IK work, all these things that are kind of going on in, in ways that are sometimes difficult to get a good handle on. And I, uh, but that's just, this is life. This is all that we've, if we want to continue to do games that are more and more aggressive, we're going to have to do more and more of this. Now, it's wonderful that everything is fast now, and if you're doing a simple game, you can write simple code, simpler than you could in the previous generation. Uh, a 360 or a PS3 is a pretty damn fast machine. I, you know, it's always amusing when we think back to high-end workstations that we all lusted over and got for earlier game development and realize that you know, our cell phones are more powerful than that, let alone our game consoles. So there's a huge amount of power, but there is a never-ending appetite for what we can do with it. And if we want to continue to take those steps, what are we going to do with the next order of magnitude of performance there? It is all about parallelism and how we split things up. And there are some non... Everybody... Well, you've got classes of people. You've got the naive people that say, oh, you just use threads. You know, you see that kind of blithe little assessment on there. People that have never done a real multi-threaded high-performance application. But then you get the people that, that worry about, you know, deadlocks and uh, you know, lock contention, different things like that, the standard programming type of thing on there. And it is difficult, challenging, and, and tough. One, you know, one side benefit of the way the PS3 is set up, because the processors are very specialized on there, it forces you to program in a certain way that's 
not necessarily natural in the way you break things up, but it does have some benefits. You know, if you program in a way that works on the PS3, there, you are less likely to do certain bad things that you might do on a PC or on Xbox with general symmetric threading on there. Uh, yes, I'm looking on the bright side of a situation for an architecture that we would not have chosen to be that way. I am, but yes, chuckles from the programmers over, <laughs> over here. I am, but there are some non-obvious worries with uh, the parallelism that I, there is a pileup of latency that can impact gameplay fairly significantly if you let it, where at the first level where you say, okay, we're going to run the renderer on one thread, the game on the other thread. Uh, they can both work together in parallel. But what that means is that if you're running 60 frames per second with game in parallel with renderer, it's still taking a 30th of a second from the time your control is read by the game to the time that the render is done rendering it. And then you may also have a vertical resync issue before you actually get a view up there. So there's a hidden latency there. Now certain architectures, like the, the Power VR drive tilers like you've got on the iPhone, they have, uh, and also like Larrabee is going to be, there is an implicit additional step of the entire scene must be run through the tiler, which is sort of a separate parallel step, before you can even start drawing pieces of it. So that can wind up being, depending on how you set it up, that might be another 60th of a second there. And then, if you start trying to accelerate additional work in the game code, say you want to go ahead and do your collision detection or some of your animation work or something in another thread running uh, in parallel a frame deferred, all of a sudden you may have another frame there. So you may go from, you trigger something, the game figures something out, the next frame, the animation system starts actually moving into position. In the next frame, you draw the muzzle flash on it. And then a frame goes by before the renderer actually draws it. And then another frame might go by before it actually gets out to the outside. And that's, you know, that's a problem. I, you have to worry about that on games where some of the easy parallelism that you might get there comes at the expense of latency. And that's true in most cases. Now, for, for almost everything right now, Adding a 60th of a second of latency is not a bad choice at all. But if you fall down to 30 hertz on there and you add another frame for, uh, for say, animation or some game type thing that's running deferred from there, all of a sudden you're closing in on 100 milliseconds of lag, essentially, uh, on your own system if you don't do things to take it, uh, to kind of uh, shortcut that as much as possible. And that's, uh, that's a real issue because that sort of paradigm of deferring things from a game then running in parallel with the renderer is a fairly good way to take advantage of the processing resources there. And this has, you know, for technical people, you start finding all of these similarities to hardware design, where you look at a traditional microprocessor pipeline. You know, you've got phase one doing instruction fetch, you know, decode, execute, execute, write back. Uh, and that all looks good in the original college textbook on there, but then you start looking at the details about how, oh, but they, they route this little thing around here and this feeds back over to here so it doesn't have to cycle through. And that's the type of stuff that has to start being done in a lot of the parallel programming work going on to make sure that you can short circuit things. Like we can say, okay, we're, we're pressing fire on the button here, but we're not going to wait for the animation to go ahead and go through its work there. We're going to go ahead and start something up right here. And I get tempted sometimes to even look at going a step further and uh, maybe short circuiting some view stuff in entire game frames so you could have a little bit more, uh, a little bit crisper feedback on the renderer there. And if we were, if we had a mouse type control, I would be almost tempted to do that on the consoles. You know, with the game pads, they, uh, you know, they add sort of a degree of imprecision where people are a little bit more forgiving about latencies there. You know, which is kind of a shame. The, one of my other big uh, exciting things about Quake Live to me is that it is, it is the mouse keyboard interface, best possible way to play an FPS on there, no concession to game pads. We're not, you know, dumbing anything down in some way so that it's going to be reasonable to do on a console. Uh, because I do, especially, Another thing that I love about QuakeCon coming here is watching the really high-end players, you know, just watching that ultimate precision of running around and just knowing that, yeah, you watch pro Halo players or whatever, and, and they're good and precise, but they're not good and precise like a high-end Quake Live player there. You know, there's, there is a different level of kind of finesse and accuracy there. Uh, so the, uh, you know, parallelism and what we're doing with that is 
the big programmer task on there. There's still all the normal mundane things about how you set up your class hierarchies and how you make things uh, reliable in different ways, but the big ticket question is how we take advantage of parallelism. And that's going to change probably fairly radically in the next generation of consoles. And we still don't know what anybody's doing on consoles. I, you know, they've, we think that it's very likely that Intel is going to be throwing all their weight behind the Larrabee solution on there. They're going to want, you know, they're going to definitely, definitely want to get a console win one way or the other on there. Uh, NVIDIA has certainly the great history with uh, what they've been doing with CUDA and the parallelization on all that. And AMD, ATI have great relationships with some of the console vendors. You know, you hear, it's always interesting hearing from the companies about, you know, what was good or bad dealing with NVIDIA versus ATI, and I'm not going to repeat all that publicly, dirty laundry, but it's kind of interesting to hear from there about who's on whose good side and what that may mean for next generation console wins there. But I, it's going to be a different ball game for sure. I would be shocked. Maybe Nintendo would come out with something that's conventional, that's a little bit less aggressive in next gen there, but I think it's a foregone conclusion that Microsoft and Sony, if you want to be doing something that's going to be hot new tech on the next gen stuff, you're going to be dealing with, you know, hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands of threads and tasks and things going on, depending on which architecture and how it's set up. And that's that's a completely different ball game from what we're doing now. There are sort of sweet spots for different parallel tasking stuff on there where two processors is a sweet spot. Run your game, run your, run your render. We were doing stuff like that all the way back on the Genesis 32X. You know, that was my first multiprocessor game application when I, I ported Doom onto the 32X and you had two CPUs, SH2 CPUs, arcane old things. I am. That's a good sweet spot. Easy to do. Everyone can understand that. Um, it's not too bad going up to four or five processors on there, which is kind of where you're at on the Xbox. You've got three processors, six threads. You can kind of hand schedule that without much trouble. Um, the PS3 with sort of eight-ish threads on, on there is kind of almost in a no man's land where it's more than you really want to manually schedule, but it's not exactly a sea of processors that will smooth over all the jobs that you throw at them. But uh, the far extreme now is what we have with the high-end GPUs running CUDA and stuff like that, where there was a great quote from one of the NVIDIA people saying, I wouldn't get out of bed for less than 10,000 threads. And when you're talking pixels, that's great, you know, 10,000 pixels, sure, we can throw millions of pixels at you. But figuring out how to split up other work into, the, into that level of granularity is more challenging. And I, I know, like two years ago, we were talking about how we think we're going to be architecting next-gen stuff uh, in terms of threading. And we would talk about things like, uh, one of the natural sounding things is like, well, you let each object in the game be its own thread. And of course, you're looking at that going, people that have been through it think, okay, that's going to be a nightmare of synchronization, race conditions, and all of this. And we start talking about interesting, clever ways to maybe go around things like that, double buffering state, using memory protect protection to catch things, rerunning frames to like look for race conditions, interesting things around there. But where we pretty much settled on, I after kind of all of our experience up here is that we let the game code just be a gnarly mess of code uh, that just kind of runs through in a single threaded form, but everything that's expensive, whether it's traces, collision detections, obstacle avoidance, uh, all that stuff, animation frame building, we move off into jobs that run in parallel. That eats that extra frame of latency for some of those things on there, but it lets the game code still be creative. And that's one of the things that you know, that we really have to worry about in that there are things that we can do both graphically and game technology, game, uh, kind of like game play wise, where we can say this will be a reliable, robust way of doing uh, game play, of doing multi-threaded. We can take advantage of things like this. But if it's one of these things that you have to program in this very, very rigid way, systems programmers, we deal with that. We're, you know, we're supposed to deal with that. That's our job. But we have to let the people that are the creative game types that are doing the gameplay, the fun stuff, 
we don't want to have to worry about somebody saying, I want to do this awesome spin around, blow up, uh, shatter thing, and I'm going to carve it up into little cell SPU jobs on there. You know, you don't want that. That's going to actually make your games worse. You may have more power, but if it's harder for anybody to do what they want to with it, it's going to be a problem. So where we think we're going with that is we still leave the game code a gnarly mess. And and it is a mess. I mean, whenever, you know, I work mostly in the, on the systems code side of things, and when I have to step through all the game code stuff on there, I, it's, I, you know, it's some of those things that makes, it, makes systems programmers weep a little bit when we go through. It's like, what? We're allocating a list of all of this, and we're freeing this, and firing traces off for all of this. But in the end, if it looks cool, and we hit our frame rates, that's what, you know, that's what we, that's what we want. I, so we don't want to make it where the game code people have to program in some uh, you know, uncomfortable way on there. Although there is a lot to be said for... Uh, you can tell the difference between people that have, have been programming games for 15, 20 years. You know, the old timers that maybe even started out in assembly language, but at least did lots of their work with C. Uh, you know, you get different... Uh, different programming styles from people that uh, are much newer, that like, got out of college recently generally and did all sorts of Java programming or whatever in college and have a certain way of, of programming and style put into them. And uh, you, know, you see a lot of things that will make the old timers kind of uh, chuckle and wince at the same time when you're like, oh, you really didn't want to be doing that. You know, I try to tell people to uh, an instructive thing to have to do in a game, if you can bear it, is to try to single step through uh, an entire game frame. I uh, just kind of start at the beginning, single step, step past every loop, but try to go through everything that happens there. And you'll never make it through before you just start crying if you're a systems programmer. Because you're just like, my God, I can't believe I can't believe our game even runs doing all of this stuff. I. Uh, and it happens from all sorts of stuff. Some of it is just archaeological evolution. Like, right now we're working on a code base that is basically five years old. And a lot of stuff happens in five years. You know, you have programmers come, a few programmers have left that started on significant things there. We've got lots of new programmers. When new people come in, they don't know what somebody else was thinking four years ago when they wrote a certain thing, so they just make it work. And of course, that is the important thing. It's get it to work. And that's uh, when we look at people, like when we, when we interview people for jobs, I, the biggest thing that we look at on people, number one, of course, is what have you done previously in terms of commercial stuff. Uh, but number two, if we're looking at somebody that, uh, that's new, that hasn't worked in a commercial company, what we care about is you know, the kind of get her done, people that have gone and made something happen. Even if it you know, even if it's really bad internally, if they had an idea and they made it happen, uh, I, would rather, I would rather educate someone with that drive and background than try to, you know, take somebody that, that programs in the tightest possible way and make them more creative. So, I, you know, I, I do bitch and moan a little bit about, uh, you know, how some of the code winds up looking in different places, but that's conscious decisions about it's going to happen there. We're just going to live with that type of stuff. But I, uh, you know, going forward, we hope to be able to continue that friendly sandbox approach there. One of the lines that I'm still not sure whether we cross, though, is script heavy versus code heavy. Because we did go through this with Doom 3, where Doom 3 had a lot of things in script that by the end of the project, we were like, oh, this was an awful mistake. I, you know, lots of AI and animation, and unfortunately, we didn't convey that message well enough to Splash Damage, where Splash Damage went off and did a whole bunch more stuff in script, and we were like, oh, we should have told them we figured that was a bad idea by the end of the project, I, you know, in terms of performance, debugability, maintainability, and all that. So we really took a big uh, kind of U-turn on Rage and just said, okay, Real programming will be done in C++. I game stuff and scripting, you know, start this thing here, blow this thing up over there. You can trigger that in script. And that's, that's serving us well in Rage, although they're edging back on that on Doom. 
with, they've got a lot more cinematic heavy stuff, a lot more scripting things going on, and they've hired dedicated scripting people. So I think they're going back to leveraging that a little bit more. And it'll be interesting to see whether that's, whether we converge on a happy medium or if it's just a seesaw of overshooting uh, strategies each time. And of course, when you're on a four-year development cycle on there, it takes a while for pilot-induced oscillations like that to damp out. But I, the, the expectation still is that happy, friendly programming sandbox for the game developers because they, they have to make the fun stuff. All the rest of us systems programmers are going to be working in the nitty gritty stuff, cutting it all up, trying to get, you know, get the performance that we can get out of this. Now, the big thing that I'm looking for is this next gen geometry virtualization side of things for graphics. But there are still a bunch of things that it's amazing how we're always running out of performance, even just on the game code there. You know, you make the game code, and for the longest time for Rage now, the game thread has been the dominant factor. We are, performance now is not focusing so much on optimizing the renderer. Uh, the more important things we're doing now are optimizing the game code, figuring out which of these things we need to break out into the parallel jobs on there. Uh, and it turns out it doesn't take that much effort to to figure out to just deal with deferred queries on things. Like, it is some work, and it takes, in the good old days, everything was, you just, okay, I'm blowing up a bomb here, tell me everybody that's around me, inflict damage on all of them, uh, put up a new model and go through and draw that. But it's not that hard for people to decide to work with and say, all right, I'm blowing up a grenade here, I'm gonna toss out a query for uh, everybody around me, and then you get that back the next frame, and you apply the damage the, the eye in that frame, and work through all of that. And we think that's the model that we're pursuing here. That we do not want to try and do. There's other interesting directions. I mean, if you went with a scripting language, you could potentially solve a lot of the the thorny technical problems. And if you said write your entire game in a certain type of scripting language, and then let it all kind of blow out and let the system handle it, and that's that's enticing in some ways, and some people are sort of looking at that direction, and I'll be interested to kind of see how things pan out with it. But we think that we know we can make games like this, and our mantra going forward here is that we do not want to completely tear up our entire world again. I, this is the, the, the Intech 5 generation where pretty much everything is new. I, we do not expect id tech 6 to cover every subsystem. We expect it to be an evolution on a lot of these things and a completely new graphics subsystem. Uh, but because again, the graphics is not that large of a chunk of the work on things. Uh, it's, you know, we, we only have a handful of the graphics programmers in there compared to all the other stuff. So we're going to evolve that so everybody else doesn't have to relearn everything while the graphics and parallelism people will be off working on new stuff in such a way that all of a sudden limits that you had before are gone, certain things just get lots better on there. And, you know, that is kind of the plan going forward. And we should be, you know, it's going to be interesting. We have to react to a lot of the stuff on there about how the consoles come out in that I, uh, we don't know when the next-gen console is going to come out. Nobody does, and everybody has in the industry has an opinion on whether it's going to be earlier or later. It'd be better for us if it was later. We would like to be able to ramp up a third team with id Tech 5 uh, and have something that's trailing end of this generation. But we may wind up with a cross-generational strategy, which would be interesting. I, you know, we could have some important games have shipped kind of across the... You know, PS2, 360, uh, console boundary, but usually not edge pushing things on there. So I don't know how that's going to work out. Uh, it is different for us having to focus on this because before it was always, you know, we're a PC company. PCs are always getting faster. We'll make something and when it comes out, we'll just see how much of the market actually can bear that. But uh, it's a little bit different now looking at this. But we've got plans and backup plans and different strategies to seeing how things will go. But still very, very exciting. So I think we're probably about time to uh, start wrapping up, and uh, I can take questions from anybody about anything. Yeah, right there. Uh, with all the responses you're getting like, live from, you know, the newer users, experienced users, a lot of competitive players, uh, and of course the advertisers and things like that, are, are things kind of going to go along the same smooth track mm -hmm. you've been pursuing, or are we going to see any major adaptations? The current plan on Quake Live is, 
Uh, the next big thing coming up will be a, a premium service that lets people have private game servers uh, for a, um, you know, a subscription fee on there where they can take control and set up things exactly how they want. Uh, I don't foresee any really major changes in the way the Quake Live project will be going forward. Uh, there should be additional content coming. Uh, the pace of it will depend on, you know, on a lot of factors. Uh, you know, we hope that there will be some interest in, uh, in companies sponsoring levels and doing different things for, uh, for tie-ins there. Uh, but we'll continue to do some internally. I mean, it's been, you know, it's certainly been nice for some people that going back and making Quake Live levels is a lot of fun for some of the people in the company, and I expect there will still be some more of that. Um, I mean, honestly, the, the in-game advertising stuff has not been big business. I, you know, we're, everybody's complaining about the advertising market on there, but it is uh, pretty clear at this point that that's not going to be able to kind of carry the project just on in-game advertising. So we're going to find out whether, you know, I want to see Quake Live becoming a little bit more of a, I, you hate the term, but a little bit more of a portal to the community and more stuff going on there in addition to just the game. You know, I want to see more things to bring people in. But the, some form of a pro subscription uh, thing on there is probably going to be what's needed to close the business model on that. I'm, but it's sunk costs right now, so it doesn't... Uh, well, the back end is actually kind of expensive, but uh, there's no danger of anything disappearing on, uh, on any of that, and we will continue running the stuff for... I mean, you, we wouldn't be able to say this was a failure for at least a couple years, the way we're looking at it. It was not something that... I'm hoping that we can actually do a media push and actually market the game here fairly soon once we kind of hit all the things that we thought we were going to have a year ago on there with the leaderboards and the uh, tuning the matchmaking and getting the other platforms and everything on there. So I'm hoping that we get to make a good push here. Um, but seeing what comes out of it in terms of you know, major focus changes, I, I couldn't imagine us... You know, it would never become a non-free service. I, it would never, I could, I would be hugely surprised if it ever became like multiple games coming off of there at the same time on there. I think Quake Live is going to be Quake Live for the foreseeable future, but I, I think it's only just now that we're really going to be able to put it to the test. So, yeah. Uh, I was wondering, um, oh, sorry. Uh, I was wondering if you'd, you'd like to discuss your opinions on the, uh, the what seems to be the growing trend of cloud computing and games, the, the on live uh, announcement in March at, at GDC and Dave Perry's project and some other stuff that's popped up, uh, this business of storing a game on a server and having you play a uh, supposedly graphically rich PC game on a, on, a, on a poor laptop. What do you think about that? Okay. Is, that is that feasible? Yeah, so that's actually I meant to hit on. Those are a couple interesting things that I that I, I wanted to talk about. So thanks for bringing that up. the The cloud computing computing infrastructure stuff is it is a really wonderful thing going on here. From especially from like a small startup business standpoint, the rent and scale server technology on there is a wonderful thing. Things like that are just going to be great for the the broad computer industry as a whole. Anything that makes it easier for a smaller group of people to marshal large resources, just signing up with Amazon services and being able to have 10,000 servers run when you spike for some special event on there. That's real and it's good. And we, I actually pushed for looking into that a little bit for backending some of the Quake Live stuff, but I, you know, it was, it, and again, that may yet have been something that might have been a better direction to go on some of the, uh, the ways. We've got a co-located facility for the, the back-end stuff right now, and, and maybe a cloud solution might have been, uh, been better under different software and different things there. But as far as using it for gaming, there are some interesting things to note about the pace of, of technology advance in hardware here, where obviously we're pretty much topped out on scalar frequency advances. Uh, we'll get a little bit more. Maybe there will be some wonderful breakthrough that gets us another couple factors of two, but you know, we're not going to go 100 times faster in scalar processing. So it is all about parallel processing now. And what's interesting is you start winding up coming up against uh, power limits and some other things there, where uh, you know, if you look at if you look at the AC adapter for an Atari 2600 or a Nintendo, you know, it's this nice light little thing. You know, you pick up the brick from a 360 there, and there are some trends there that are not, uh, 
Die shrinks continue to make processing more power efficient as well, but we're cramming more and more things on there and making more parts of it active at the same time. For, for a few more orders of magnitude, we can certainly scale area and power with it, but this is starting to get pretty hungry. And how we go additional orders of magnitude beyond that, one of them may well be common computing resources on there, because if everybody here uh, all the computing resources that you've got in your consoles, your cell phones, your PCs are generally 90-something percent underutilized. Uh, in fact, much more than that now that a lot of people have multi-core systems that even when you're sitting down on them, they're not actually all that utilized. So as we, we learn as an industry how to divide things up into these better parallel jobs, there may yet be things that can go off and be done uh, you know, even off the local host. The killer, as always with a lot of this stuff, is latency. And, uh, but it is worth thinking about the idea of running games on a server and delivering them to cell phones on there. Now, early stuff, if you layer that on top of standard protocols and stuff, and demos have been done of this where you basically have a, a streaming video server where you've got a game running here, and this is classic web bolt together stuff where you run something over here, this process over here, screen scrapes this and compresses it and it goes out over a streaming server and it shows up over on someone's cell phone. And that's a cool demo, but it's not really a playable game on there. If you get down to what's actually possible at the hardware level and you take every piece of that stack and closely look at it and you start saying, well, there are some broadband links that are probably good enough to play many classes of games. Now, Quake Live is going to be the last class of game that, you know, that goes to a stream over video where it's a Twitch reaction type thing on there. But a lot of people have sort of blinders on for their type of game on there where I did see a lot of people just utterly dismissing that type of remote gaming on there. And I don't think that's the case because uh, you could totally play The Sims or something like that in a remote game like that streamed over there. There's lots of classes of games. And even of the games that people do think of as action games, there's, there's, a lot more, uh, there's a lot more room in the market than a lot of people give credit for. I mean, there are probably a bunch of people here that played games with 400 pings over modems uh, on there. And you know, people, given the right experience, will do certain things like that, will put up with you know, a worse conditions than what this could possibly be. So, uh, the other upside of that is client-side cheating vanishes. Uh, it becomes a vision problem at that point, which is, you know, much more, you don't get, you don't get just like little miscreants writing aim bots for that. That's, you know, you go write your PhD thesis, then you're a miscreant with it. Uh, and it's much, much harder. So there are upsides to that where cheating becomes a much, much harder type thing to do with everything running on the server. And there are major development aspects there that are better. You never patch anything. It's all running on the server. It's like a web app, which has significant benefits. But when you come down to the actual rubber meeting the road, which most of our games and QuakeCon and everything is about, it's like, no, there's some pretty serious disadvantages there. But there are definitely times when I almost went and did that. I'm, you know, a couple of years ago, I was just thinking, yeah, I... I was, yeah, I almost did a little stream over to a cell phone type thing because this would be a neat technology demo. I could go whip it together fairly quickly. It would be an interesting thing to look at. And the real work on that's going to come down to getting to the bottom of the stacks on there. You know, you don't go over an HTTPS streaming server or something on there. You figure out how to use the right quality of service packets that get set at the link level over uh, whatever interface you're going over. And there's a lot of work that can do, go there to knock that 100 milliseconds off of it and get down to, in many people's cases, you might be able to get some of these things with 50-something millisecond lags. And as I mentioned earlier, some games are giving 50 millisecond lags in their internal processing. So it is not a crazy idea. In fact, it's fairly interesting in terms of what the potential may be. Because imagine uh, a system like that where you don't have your library of games, and certainly Steam is doing good things in terms of centralizing libraries, letting people distribute. But if it was just like your Gmail account or something where you just go and you play whatever game you want by just going going there from anywhere. That's the vision. And it's not happening this year. It's not happening next year. But 10 years from now, you know, I, I wouldn't be shocked if that wasn't a, 
a significant paradigm for a lot of gaming on there. And there are significant benefits from a back end standpoint with load sharing and kind of the cloud computing standpoint. So let me go, yeah, you. Return to Castle Wolfenstein source and Wolfenstein enemy territory source will be out. Oh, I completely forgot to mention some of this stuff. So the number one question that I got I, after the Zenimax deal was what happened to id open source I, deals on here? And I had to give this not very reassuring, you know, to be determined. I, I mean, that just wasn't at the top of anybody's priority lists on there. And so it still is, it's going to be a case by case basis, but I made the pitch for the, the Doom Classic on the iPhone. I've been building that on the PR Boom code base. And the option is, of course, to go back to our original code base and move everything over. And I really didn't want to do that. But I, you know, I pitched it to the, the head of Zenimax and said, here's the choices. Uh, I don't think there's any harm for doing the open source on here. Uh, it's going to save time. Uh, I think it's, it'll be appreciated by the community. And you know, and Robert Altman just said, do what you think's best. So uh, that's definitely coming out open source. Again, it's going to be case by case. I, I wanted to go make the pitch for the Wolfenstein stuff this week because they're coming down here. I mean, I'll probably talk with them about it tomorrow when I get to sit down with them. But just unfortunately, it's not at the top of our priority lists, but it is still something that I, I do care a lot about. I, and it's, that's been one of these other great things about the id classics on the iPhone stuff. This is my first time where I've really been able to go, look, I told you it would come back and be some real commercial benefit for us. I mean, I'm, I'm always tacking it on goodwill and, you know, the community likes it. It's a, it's a positive thing to do and all this. But, you know, we went out and, and made a good chunk of money on uh, the Wolfenstein stuff because I was able to whip that together in two days because there was an open source version maintained that had, I, you know, that had OpenGL acceleration on there. And now building the Doom stuff on PR Boom is great because, you know, it's just, it's just a better code base. You know, they cleaned up all the stuff that, <laughs> that I had done poorly <laughs> 20 years ago. Well... Yeah. Oh, we're out of time? Well, I can take a few. I mean, I'm fine <laughs> until we're ready feel, to be chased out. Yeah. How do you feel about the level two Lunar Lander challenge this year? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, at the risk of talking for another two hours about rocketry stuff, I am. <laughs> yeah, th things are. My life has gotten so busy. It's just, it's funny when I look back, and I know I used to work 16 hour days on some things, but it just seems like I had more free time at some point where there were lazy Sundays sometimes, and it's just, time is amazingly overcommitted now. Uh, I haven't done an armadillo update on the website in like three, three months, four months, or something, but we have a lot going on. We've been flying, the rocket plane's been flying all week, uh, this week up at the Grayson County Airport in North Dallas. Uh, lots of flights going on of that. Uh, we are set for this. This may be the uh, the first public. I'm not positive if I'm supposed to say this, but uh, <laughs> uh, La Labor Day weekend is our uh, is our LLC uh, first flight attempt on this. So the great thing is that we don't have to go to New Mexico. We get to do this at our home base, uh, which is a huge deal because. You work on something, you test it all this time, and then you, you load it up and you drive thousands of miles to New Mexico in different conditions. There's a lot of things that can go wrong there. Now, the regulatory stuff is in such a position where we get to do it at our home base, and that's going to help a lot, which means we get to kind of stage the battlefield to our advantage as much as possible. We get to go, like, set up permanent cameras in different places, set the pads at the orientation we want, and I, I think we've got a, you know, a much, much better shot at that this year. But we've actually had, uh, you know, the interesting thing, Armadillo turned a marginal profit last year uh, doing work for Rocket Racing League, work for NASA. Uh, we are starting to carry some scientific payloads on some small, uh, small flights. So it's, it's slowly bootstrapping its way up. Uh, you know, there's, and I actually, I actually expect things to be going significantly faster in this coming year for a few reasons, some of which I, I can't talk about yet. Um, anybody else? Yeah. Uh, you talked about rehashing some of the older titles for iPhone. Is there any chance for a Commander Keen title? Yeah. The, the other thing about the iPhone is because these titles don't take that long to, to develop, all of a sudden I'm thinking about, I, you know, I've got eight titles I'd love to do on there. Because 
one of my big things about what makes doing a title interesting to me is trying to do something that's either high leverage, like using our classic stuff on there and working out a new control scheme, or something that really plays to the platform in a particular way. So I have a few technical ideas um, that one thing I'd like to do on an iPhone game to make a super easy to play game you hold it sideways and it's just left, right, both of them for jump, and then you do the whole Mario trick jumping things with you know, triple jumps, wall jumps, make, make the control system nothing more than two things that you press on there with no missing and have all of the skill be kind of finessing off of that on there. So that's a control scheme I would like to try and I have an animation graphical hook that I would like to explore on a side scroller where uh, I would like to try treat the player as just a box, as, you know, as normal and the simplest possible thing, but do very smart predictive look ahead for the animation so that even if your box is just going to bounce wall jump off like that, because we have, you know, good prediction on there, you're following a parabolic arc even if you've got air control, I have ideas about how I would like to schedule animation by predicting ahead to where an impact is going to be so that instead of covering the wall jump with a little puff of smoke there, you could see a character, you know, jump up, heel over, and you know, crouch down and kick off, all without impacting the gameplay because certainly some games that do cool animation on scrollers hurt the gameplay by making it not responsive because you have to cycle through animation. So I've got, I've got a control screen I want to try and I've got a graphical hook I want to try. Uh, it's not scheduled for work, but that may be one of those things that uh, I run off and I do a proof of concept, some retreat time on there, and then we make a call about whether we want to turn it into a product on, or something on there. So we could, you know, it's surprising how often I get asked that in that Keen didn't have that many users in the larger scheme of things, you know, uh, but it seems like so many people remember it and bring it up. I, you know, and maybe there were five million people that played the sharer version that never registered. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, can you talk just a little bit about your experiences with your Tesla? And I'm curious if you have any plans to uh, overclock it, so to speak. <laughs> So yeah, the Tesla is my, my electric sports car on there, and I got into that because the I, I had followed some of the uh, kind of hot rod electric car stuff. There's an interesting scene with electric drag racers taking these big electric motors and hordes of batteries and doing pretty respectable, especially eighth mile times on there. Uh, so I was vaguely aware of all of this, but Elon Musk, who is the I, you know, the PayPal founder guy that's running SpaceX, I, a company that. You know, I talked with him about space stuff on there, but he became the prime investor for Tesla Motors. And I talked about this for a while. I was like, oh, this would be neat on this. But I've actually, everybody still thinks that I, I have all my Ferraris and everything on there. Uh, but I've actually become quite frugal in a lot of ways on there because Armadillo, when you spend half a million dollars a year on a project and you're not sure when it's actually going to start making money on there, I... Uh, it had been, I hadn't bought a $100,000 toy in many, many years on this, so I was at the point there, well, you know, it's kind of neat, I wish him well on all this, but uh, my wife went off and bought, bought one for my birthday, <laughs> I, which was, yeah, which was pretty awesome. <laughs> so, I, but of course what happened on there is they said they're going to ship uh, at this particular time, and I'm like, oh, this is just like a software product. They delayed six months and they delayed a year and, you know, and it just got to the point where, I'm like, well, when it's done, I'll be happy and it'll get here. Uh, early this year, it finally did get done and I had number 30 off the line on there. And it is, it is a really interesting experience on there where it has no gears, so it is just like a golf cart, forward reverse on there. You have all the torque that the engine makes from zero RPM. It starts tailing off at about 4,500 RPM, and it, uh, it maxes out at 13,000 RPM. That's my license plate, 13K RPM on there. Uh, and it's, it's not as fast as like my, my crazy Ferraris were. You know, my Testarossa had 1,000 horsepower, which is just... And actually, that was 1,000 horsepower at the real wheels. It's not like a Viren where it's measured at the crankshaft and it's a two-ton car on there. You know, it's 1,000 horsepower on a dyno at the rear wheels. So that sets a benchmark that not many other things are going to be able to 
really kind of play with. And even all my other ones, to a large degree, I ruined high performance cars for me. You know, if I go and I drive a, I drive a 911 Turbo or some new car, and I'll be like, it's pleasant. I, you know, it's, uh, I am. But, you know, it's not that kind of like a uh, white knuckle uh, thing that people hope that they, they give you when you drive a car like that. Um, in many ways, the, the Tesla as an electric car is the opposite of my Testarossa, where I'm, the Testarossa, it really didn't get into its own until you were up on the highway. I, you, you know, it, it, it could not do a really great uh, off-the-line launch. It just it breaks parts of its transmission, doesn't have enough tire to, to hold everything down there. But, you know, if you're on the highway, if you're going 40 miles an hour and you want to go 180, you know, faster than damn near anything ever made there. And that's an interesting set of experiences. The, uh, the electric car is the polar opposite of that, where it's, uh, it makes all of its power at zero RPM. It has perfect traction control. You know, it never squeaks the tires at all. And it's totally quiet. So every stop sign you go to, Literally, like 90% of the times I come to a stop, if it's a straight line ahead of me, I put my foot to the floor, and you just get rubber banded ahead. It's not anti... If I did that with the Testarossa, it was anti-social. I mean, people could hear me three miles away when I, would, I, when I would get on it on that car. So it's just not something that you do every little corner on there. So, and the thing that I had found towards the end, early on, the people that have seen the, the history of it, like the older it office, when we were in the big black cube building, I had a service road there. So every morning I'd drive to work and I'd go 140 miles an hour on the service road and everyone could tell when John's about to arrive at office and I make sure that they're looking productive there when I get in. <laughs> I, when we moved our office to our current location, I just didn't have that route. I would drive all the way from home to work and there was never any place where I got on any of the cars. So it's like, you know, what's the point of having a vehicle like this if you're not actually going out and exercising it? And it used to be we would go out to the track once a year or something, but it's been years since I felt we've had time to do that. So I, there, it just got to this point where eventually I sold off the various Ferraris on there. And for a long time I was driving just you know, BMWs I, for I, carrying rocket parts in my X5. You know, that was one of the things that looked really stupid having McMaster car boxes sticking out of the, you know, out of the top of an F50 or something. But, uh, but the, the Tesla is a very different thing in that you get so many more smiles per day as far as high performance car smiles. You know, when you get on it, you just grin a little bit because that was fun. And it's got a lot of value for that. I, it's not it's no great shakes up on the highway. If you're going 80 miles an hour, it's already past its torque and power curves. It'll get up to 125, 130, but it's not, it's not going to run down a super bike up there like I could in the Testarossa. Um, so, but for the majority of the business, that I, the driving that I do, it's a, it's a lot of fun. So it's got rough edges. It's you know, it's at least partially a British car. I have a history with British cars on there, but the things that, that have broken a little trim pieces, stuff like that. But I do think there is a big future for it. The thing that people complain about on electric cars, they say, how can you drive a car with only 200 miles range? And it turns out this is just a non-argument. You plug it in, you drive home, and you get out of the car, you plug it in, it's fully charged the next day. There are very few days that I drive more than 200 miles in a single day. And I think most people are like this. Yeah, there are going to be some people that have to constantly be doing you know, road work around where an electric car is not the right thing. But I'm actually pretty bullish on the, the, the potential for this for widespread use. Because even if you have a detuned version, something that's cheaper, I, you know, their next version is a sedan that's $50,000. It's not quite as high a performance but it's going to have that same drivetrain feel to it. And once you've driven something like that, normal cars feel very primitive. With the, the shifting, you're always in the wrong gear. It's, you know, your foot is an accelerator. It's not a throttle in an electric car. It's connected to a potentiometer. It's like more thrust, less thrust. You know, it's not a matter of opening up butterflies, which, you know, let air into an engine that's probably turning at the wrong RPM, needs an accelerator pump shot to get into it. All of that's gone. So it is better. But, of course, the whole thing behind electric cars is the, 
you know, the eco-friendly bit and all of that, and a lot of that's a sham. I mean, I do take some ironic pleasure in the fact that, you know, I, I'm fairly hostile to most of the green eco crowd for all sorts of rational reasons, and yet I'm, you know, I'm driving an electric car most days now, so there's some, uh, you know, little bit of pleasure in that, but as far as electric cars aren't going to, you know, you spend so much more money. It costs $100,000 for this. Even though driving it costs two cents a mile, I'm not going to put half a million miles on the, uh, on the vehicle there. You know, there is less, less impact to the environment, less hydrocarbons, this or that, if you just drive the car that you've got rather than getting an electric car, which is sort of the scam of all of that stuff. But as we look over the long term, I think it's a big future because you can make better cars like that that are more fun to drive. And, you know, you don't necessarily, you can run them off nuclear power. So I think it's a good thing going forward. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, one of the great things about Doom 3 was that you could just uh, bring down the console, uh, get into the editor, and just make some changes and see those changes in real time and then kind of hop right back into the game and, uh, and play around with those changes. Um, I assumed that with Rage that it was going to be maybe a combination of pre-computed lighting and real-time things where you could just kind of pop right into the editor to make some changes and pop right back in. From the sound of it, though, it sounds like it's, it's all kind of moved towards pre-computed lighting and, uh, and that it may go back to the days where it's like you've just got to kind of make some changes and just, like you said, wait around for a while and uh, hop back into it. Is there going to be anything so like, are those days gone? Gameplay changes, all the stuff that happens in terms of placing entities and all of that, uh, that all happens, you know, very quickly. You can move things around, you can reload stuff, if you can change a model and have it reloaded in there. Uh, the high-end look of the game in terms of uh, everything coming out all polished, that's a long run on there. And yeah, this is kind of going back through, we cycled through this where we went through, in Quake 2 we had people that were building some of our licensees doing maps that took uh, you know, five days or something to light and viz on there. And then we got through to Doom 3 where there was nothing took more than two minutes or something on there. And we're, we're pushed back into a middle ground on this where uh, at least we throw enough resources at it that none of our stuff takes horribly long. I mean, you, you leave them running overnight if you're redoing it. And you don't have to do that. You can, you can move things around and redo it if you don't mind textures being pushed around into the wrong places on there. So a lot of gameplay testing happens. Rage still has a mode. You can run it in dev map or combo map. And in dev map, it's just like Doom 3, except all of the optimizations that went into Doom 3 with like culling down the lights and stenciling and doing a lot of this stuff, most of those aren't there, so it's actually a lot slower than Doom 3 was. Um, if you do that, but a lot of work, most of the gameplay testing work happens in little maps that are done, uh, you know, where they just don't care about getting the high, the high quality lighting or the 60 hertz performance out of it. So the final maps, when they bring it all together, though, that's still, that's a pretty sizable run. And I'm, it's kind of an open question. We did make, we had conversations about how important user maps and stuff were for us, and we came down on the side that we killed, we could not prioritize that significantly. And we've seen the, you know, the trends as we've gone through the maps on there where it is such, I mean, it takes us a long time for people whose job it is to learn how to do everything to make the rage maps on there. Uh, while there will be some people that want to go out and make a brand new rage map on there, it's not going to be enough of an impact for us to kind of make strategic changes based on that. And that's tough, which again was why I was, I'm so thrilled with the idea of bringing back the golden age on the iPhone, where uh, the technology is right for it, we're not going to be fighting it in some way, and I think that's, that's going to be a lot of fun. But no, Rage is not going to be a, a, you know, a real mod-friendly creating environment. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, I was just going to ask that, uh, seeing as how the id tech 5 engine seems to be such a kind of a radical departure with a lot of the like kind of systems level things, can we have the id tech 4 source yet, please? <laughs> That's going to be, so the order of big, big pushes for uh, convincing Zenimax that open source is good, the, the enemy territory Wolfenstein stuff is pretty much ready to go. We just need to have that conversation, make sure it's good. Um, then, gen you know, historically it's been when we ship the next generation, so that topic won't come up until RAID ships. <laughs> I, you know, when RAID ships and IDTech 5 is kind of on the shelves as our, our push there, then it certainly is my intention 
to make the case for that. I, I am, you know, I'm very proud of the, the contributions that I've been able to make uh, as getting ID's technology out open source over the years. And I think I'm real happy with lots of stuff that's been done with that. And I certainly want to get the ID Tech 4 stuff out there in that same way as well. Right there. Hi, I was curious if you uh, had any opinions on the current state of the Dallas game development scene. In the last few years, we've seen a whole bunch of developers close shop, um, 3D Realms, Ritual, Ensemble, that sort of thing. It used to be that Dallas had a ton of developers, and now it's uh, down to id and Gearbox and a few others I can't think of. So. I'm really not a huge industry guy. I'm, you know, I'm not one of the people that goes out and networks around with everybody and is up on all the gossip. And I'm often one of the later people to find out when something like that happens on there. Uh, at a first approximation, it benefits from things like this because we we got a lot of great employees. As you know, when when a studio goes and explodes on there, we're like, okay, who was their very best guy there, and let's go get him. I. So there's been a lot of that. I mean, obviously, a lot of the people at ID have come from. Uh, we sifted out the very best from Ion Storm uh, across all that, and then we've got people from 3D Realms. And uh, but of course, we're currently working with Nerve and Escalation locally on here. We'll probably continue to on other projects there. I, I'm not an industry guru. It's like I can't say much about what I think the you know the future of different things is there. Uh, it is harder and harder to be an independent studio and to have leverage. Uh, and like I said at the beginning, the idea of independent studios competing with the publishers are at a larger and larger disadvantages as the publishers have equivalents internally. Uh, so there's, it's tougher probably to be an independent studio now than it was some years ago but I'm not sure where that's going to go in the end. Because there are the bright sides of things like the iPhone and Xbox Live Arcade that, that allow small teams to go and do uh, good, profitable stuff. And there's, there's a bunch of teams that are making good money on that, but the teams that want to go out and want to grow to AAA studios on there, that's a, that's a tough thing. I don't think I... It'd be tough for me to recommend that it's a great idea for somebody to go out and start a new game studio at this point if their intention is to go and compete head-on eventually on next-gen console stuff. But again, I'm not sure I'm the best person to ask for advice on that. So, anybody else? All right. Oh, one more. You know, in the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of um, kind of diminishing... I guess appearance from like physics and stuff like that. Where do you think um, hardware physics versus software physics is headed? Okay, hardware physics. I, I, I think I was fairly public about my, I, my thinking that that was a really bad I, idea. And in fact, it was pretty clear to me from early on that the whole idea for that was to do a startup to be acquired. I, I didn't feel it was actually. I actually had a, a really quite negative opinion about stuff like that because they went out, they evangelized, they got some people to buy a piece of hardware that I didn't think was actually a good technical direction for things on there. Certainly was going to be supplanted by later generations of more integrated compute resources on there. I, I don't think it was a good idea. I, I certainly wasn't a backer of the company and like, I hope NVIDIA didn't pay a whole lot of money for them. <laughs> so... All right, thanks everyone. <laughs>